I don't know if y'all have seen some of the pictures of Lake Charles, but certainly is a, a reminder, a stark reminder that disasters can happen at any time, that it doesn't, it certainly, uh, as well as any place, it certainly doesn't mean that we are going to be here uh, uh, focused on hurricane season. Um, we we want to approach this in a very broad manner. What we want to do today is take some of the lessons learned that we have had in working with uh, hundreds of local governments across the U.S. and apply these lessons learned and, and how they impact your own community. With me today, I want to take a moment to introduce two uh, gentlemen who have I've worked with for I think since 2008 in Matt Mooningham or 2004 uh, in Hurricane Ike uh, in Pensacola in Matt Mooningham and working with Brian since 2008. Um, since he uh, joined us from Galveston County um, and just wanted to have them do a brief introduction. So uh, Matt. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Appreciate y'all having us on today, and we look forward to sharing some information with you. Like John said, my name is Matt Mooneyham, and I'm one of our regional uh, senior project managers here for Tetra Tech. Um, got uh, a lot of uh, years of experience. Uh, what my region is basically the Gulf Coast, uh, from Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, through the Panhandle of Florida, and even down into South Florida. So, um, and, and as John mentioned, uh, got a lot of experience under my belt with numerous types of events, uh, primarily hurricanes, but also uh, flooding events, uh, tornado events, uh, ice storms, that sort of thing. So uh, I appreciate y'all having me on today and uh, look forward to presenting the information we've put together for you. Thank you, Matt and Brian. Hello, I'm Brian Rutherford with Tetra Tech and uh, I've been doing this since 2008 and uh, have been involved in uh, response to uh, hurricanes and California wildfires and flooding in Texas and so uh, hurricanes in Texas. So quite a few things. Um, and so I've also been involved in a lot of the planning, helping jurisdictions write and develop plans for uh, debris management and other things as well. Um, and so I'm looking forward to uh, you know being with you and, and helping uh, answer any of your questions. Uh, prior to that, I was with Galveston County for a number of years, and then I was with the state of Texas before that. So glad to be here with you. All right. Hey, thank you uh, very much, uh, Brian and Matt, for uh, your introductions. Um, I also wanted to make a couple of more introductions here, some additional resources that um, are uh, graciously uh, uh, um, said that they would, would spend some time with us today. We have Andrea Lowe, Region 1 Unit Chief with the Texas Division of Emergency Management. I see she is on the uh, the, um, the guest list here and is logged in. Also, we've got Valerie Blanton. Uh, I'm not sure if Valerie has made it yet, but Valerie is somebody I've worked with for many, many years. Uh, and she is on. Uh, wonderful. And um, she is a wealth of information about disaster recovery and specifically debris management she has seen seen it and done it when it comes to disaster debris here in texas and has a great working relationship with our friends at region six um the the fema region six that is then also with us is uh tom ernie and michelle Bates with the texas commission on environmental quality tcq is regulatory uh, responsibility over uh, air water waste and is instrumental in the um, the process for debris management sites. So um, they've graciously come on and uh, hopefully we're going to be able to listen. And, and if we get into some dialogue, maybe they can also uh, contribute to that discussion. Um, the one thing I want to say is if you are not speaking, um, if you please uh, work your mute button. However, if you do want to speak up on the top of the team's uh, bar, is a little emoji with a hand raised if you wouldn't mind raising your hand uh, and i can myself or brian or matt will be able to call on you and then you can just unmute and we can have a discussion so if there's something that uh, you have a question about and or you would like to um you know highlight as a best practice something that you've seen please uh, we encourage that type of dialogue uh, our agenda today 
as Lisa mentioned, we're going to have a two and a half hour webinar. We're going to start with the first hour going through right about 10, um, 10 o'clock and do about a 10 minute break. And then we're going to uh, probably just go ahead and um, uh, finish it out at 1130, probably a little bit before, but uh, we'll have you out on time and uh, get back to uh, uh, doing what you're doing or grabbing lunch. That the first part, debris management one on one, is going to be an overview, a look at debris management operations, whether you are dealing with a wildfire, whether you're dealing with a uh, ice storm, hurricane, flood, or a tornado. We want to take an all hazards approach. We've done over our firm has worked with communities for over 72 different types of declared disasters. Um, and those being the five major debris generators out there. And hopefully we'll, we'll, we've also worked with large and small communities. So, you know, those communities that are in the you know, thousand or, um, you know, perhaps a long view, which is like an 81,000 or a Kilgore, which is 12,000 or 13,000 uh, uh, population jurisdiction. So we want to keep things very broad and we want to look at uh, the types of strategies and the types of debris you might be dealing with. So let's jump right into it. Uh, I've asked Matt to join me here on this part of the operation, uh, or sorry, of the presentation. What we'll be able to do is uh, go through the presentation and then have Matt provide some color commentary and be able to shed some light on some of this um, some of the applicability of these programs. So the important importance of debris management planning, one of the things we can't stress enough is to create a debris management plan. And if anything, just taking a look at this once a year and identifying the resources that can be used in the response of the debris haulers as well as debris monitoring and oversight, where are your debris management sites going to be, where are you gonna take this, stage it, what sort of equipment that you are going to be needing personnel that will be involved in the operation and then any recycling options transfer stations and landfill sites and here's the thing is debris management there are a ton of resources out there i believe the state has a debris management plan this was an initiative taken up by the uh, legislature uh, last year and this is something critical important one of the things we've seen uh, time and time again is that communities with a debris management plan are quicker and are smarter about getting the resources out quickly and uh, achieving fuller reimbursement for their debris removal operations from FEMA. So we can't stress that enough. Again, debris management plan, FEMA's got some great tools out there, very easy to find. You can provide debris estimates uh, for your planning. How much would you be looking at for your community? Are you looking at a 10,000 yard event or a million yard debris event strategies for debris clearing and collection regulations that are applicable and you must adhere to providing public information strategies and templates for use as well as identification of that federal guidance that's out there that you will need to follow and one of the things we've seen time and time again is that failure to follow the federal guidance can lead to and result in expenses that you were expecting federal funding for to not be reimbursed. So again, there's certainly strings attached to this. And in the planning process, you can help iron out some of these things when you have your lights on and your AC running versus on the back of a tailgate in a hundred degree heat, getting bit by mosquitoes. This right here is a bit of a uh, overview of the disaster recovery timeline. And one of the things I would say when it comes to the debris operation is, you know, we're looking at the right of the boom, uh, as they say in emergency management, and really in that response activities. Of course, we've talked about the normal preparedness activities and your planning activities, but your response, which is what do you need to do immediately? Clear the roads, start your truck certification processes, um, work with your public assistance team and your Texas Division of Emergency Management team and assess the need for debris management sites. And that's a really something that needs to occur in days, not weeks. And of course, that long 
term recovery or short term recovery and long term recovery. We've seen go into weeks as well as months. Heck, we're um, and I think uh, uh, Matt has been our project manager down in the southeast Texas, sorry, southwest Texas re or southwest Louisiana region. And Matt, I mean, why don't you tell us a little bit about where they are with Hurricane Laura? I think Hurricane Laura struck about August of 2020. And, and where are those communities almost a year later? Yeah, that's a great example, John. I appreciate you bringing that up because this is a this is kind of a, a scenario where it's kind of like everything that bad uh, that, that is bad that could happen has happened to those those regions in, in southern Louisiana. They got hit by Hurricane Laura, which was obviously a, a significant event. A, a, as far as a debris generating event was uh, very serious. Uh, the biggest they had seen in that area since I believe Rita. Um, you know, it said they, they, we started the debris management operations. We started the debris removal operations. And if you remember, just a couple months after that, they got hit with another storm. Um, so two storms with, you know, within a couple of months of each other. So they kind of had to kind of kind of got kicked in the chin a little bit and had to regroup. Um, they have since then also had the ice storm that they've had to deal with. And also just recently, like John mentioned early on this call, the, a flooding event now. So, I mean, we have literally had to go back to the drawing boards numerous times and kind of regroup and, uh, and, and continue down this path. Uh, they are making very, very, we are making very good progress there in the area. And we are kind of finishing up on the, the primary debris removal um, uh, program, which we consider the right-of-way program, which is removal of that debris that's located on the curb in the, in the public right-of-ways. And what we're moving now into is the next phase of that debris management response, which is the PPDR program. And we're going to get into that in more detail on these slides, but that's where we're actually going to go. Uh, FEMA has, uh, with the help of the local government, the state, and now FEMA has identified this and recognize this as this debris is causing a significant um, health and safety hazard to the to the to community as a whole. So we're actually moving into the next phase of this, which is actually going on to private property, removing that debris um, in, in the whole process that goes along with that. So uh, it is like John said, uh, August, September event. And here we are. Uh, I don't even what is the math? Seven, eight months later, and, and we're, we're still got months ahead of us there in that region. You're on mute, John. Yeah, one of the things that I saw, Matt, with um, some of the press releases for Lake Charles and Calcasieu Parish is this track almost took a exact same path as Hurricane Rita in 2005. And I believe that there was quite a bit of a uh, uh, comparison with that event versus this event. And I know there's been a lot of lessons learned and planning that's gone on with Lake Charles. Uh, wasn't it like what they picked up in six months after Rita took the, the parish or, or Lake Charles six weeks to do? Yeah, absolutely. As far as the debris generating uh, event, as far as on paper it goes, Rita, and they were com somewhat comparable storms, but uh, Laura generated a significant amount more debris. So the, the, the quantity of debris, I mean, I, I will tell you that in Lake Charles, for instance, and, and this is just the city of Lake Charles, um, at, at the height of our debris removal operations, we were removing roughly 50 or 60,000 yards, cubic yards of debris every single day. Um, that is a, a lot of trucks in a very small, uh, somewhat limited area, but the amount of debris that was generated and the amount of debris that we were removing in a short amount of time was significant. Um, and I believe you're right. I believe within six or eight weeks uh, of, of the, the Laura operations, we had already surpassed the debris um, estimates from Rita and what they what they picked up there. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Thank you, Matt. All right, well, let's get into um, that first phase, the, the emergency response phase, and this is the emergency road clearing activities. Pretty self-explanatory. Here's some pictures from the storm surge associated with Hurricane Ike in 2008 there in Galveston along I-45. And you could be dealing with, um, again, you could be dealing with boats, you could be dealing with um, uh, different types of construction and demolition debris, or it could be um, more likely could be related to trees and down power lines. Again, when you're looking at road clearing priorities, it's critical to identify those roads that you will send your crews out to and identify those lifelines immediately. Looking at the 
emergency vehicles and utility restoration crews clearing the streets where any fire stations, police, hospitals, utility, or other communication facilities are located. Um, and, and that may be um, uh, then you know where you identify those primary and secondary roads, you know where your crews are gonna go and contracted crews are gonna go, but having those uh, areas identified and mapped out will significantly increase the speed at which recovery can occur. Now, a lot of times, and Matt, you shed some light on this, this is um, paid for on a time and materials basis. And some of these crews, what is the potential, what's the, what's the normal makeup of this and what are the costs associated with this you've seen? Well, and it really depends on what kind of event we're looking at here. So, you know, what when you're talking about the, this emergency road, you know, clearing operation, you're talking about the first 48, 72 hours after the event and, and what this looks like. This could look like your own force account labor crews. This could look like your fire department, your emergency response out there with chainsaws and, and uh, being assisted by the public works department with maybe some tractors or some front end loaders. Uh, a lot of times that's what this looks like. In other terms, though, it's bad enough and, and you don't have the resources available to handle it yourself. It, it, like John mentioned, you, you, these contractors, these debris contractors are, are very familiar and able and willing to help with this. So they could bring in crews uh, depending on what the need is. If you're talking about a significant uh, vegetative event, when you're talking about trees down across the road, you're talking about not just handheld tools, chainsaws and that sort of thing, but also large equipment to clear these roads. Um, going back to the, uh, the type of event, in some instances, if it's a major flooding event or if there's major flooding involved with the storm, then you're talking about identifying, like John said, identifying where these low, low lying areas are within the city or within the county that you're dealing with. You may still need uh, to have a road clearing crew in front of your emergency response to get to some of these. You may have um, swift water rescues that you need to perform. So it, it's important to have those roads mapped. It's also important to know kind of what kind of event you're dealing with. And so those emergent, those, those reports that you're getting through the storm and as the storm clears, those initial um, assessment reports are very important to know what you're dealing with and to be able to respond accordingly. So it may be a combination of all of those things or, or it may be uh, just one or the other, depending on the type of event. Um, and those costs, like John said, they're tracked on a time and material basis, but they're as needed. So you as the client are going to be able to dictate that and say, hey, we can handle this in-house. We've got great public works crews. We're out there. We've already taken care of it. You know, Mr. Debris Hauler, we don't need any assistance. On the other hand, you may need a significant amount of assistance and say, look, we don't have the manpower. We don't have the equipment uh, or they're out dealing with other issues, drainage issues or lift stations or, or wastewater, whatever the case may be. Contractors, we need you to bring in some equipment here. I need 10 crews. Uh, and so on and so forth. And so these contracts are, are built the way that they're, they're, they're flexible in the sense that this time and material you can add and delete as necessary. Uh, it's important to have that flexibility to determine what you need on, on each, in, every disaster is different. So it's important to have that flexibility. Thanks, Matt. All right, uh, the next phase of this is truck certification. And what we mean there when it comes to truck certification is if you bring in a debris removal crew whether that is a, a single crew or a contractor um, heck even it's a good idea to certify your own trucks it's this is a this is the method of actually measuring the interior capacity of that ve hauling vehicle deducting for any protrusions like the dog box you can see here uh, where he's measuring and then placarding these vehicles placarding these uh, uh, dump bodies to make sure that you know that they are assigned to your particular city or county. This truck certification is gonna be how payment is ultimately made and is the linchpin of the debris removal operation, which is moving into the right of way. And debris along the right of way, very, very um, diverse. You could be looking at a lot of construction and demolition debris generated from a tornado, or tornadic activity. You could be dealing with vegetative debris along the right of way here. Uh, you know, a lot of pines. I know there's a lot of that in uh, East Texas and Northeast Texas. Certainly I would expect that to be a, a, a big, big lift, no pun intended for uh, those who experience debris removal um, and who are, are facing that after some of these big disasters. Another piece of this, is construction demolition 
uh, which we've seen a lot. I know, uh, Ada, there was a tornado a couple of years ago, 2012, 2013. And you know, certainly Texas is no stranger uh, to t- tornadoes. And dealing with construction demolition debris can be quite challenging. Matt, I know you dealt with a lot of C and D, or that's you know how they call it in the business. Um, you know, I, I know that's probably the least fun of any of the waste <laughs> streams out there. Uh, just given its composition, the smell stays with you. All those sorts of things. Yeah, absolutely. It, 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 there's a couple different challenges that C and D brings to the to the table. And and once again, it's going back to what kind of event have you had? You know, some of these events, if it's a like I say, a hurricane, and it's primarily wind. You know, you're going to have a lot of tree vegetative type damage, uh, a tornado that hits a somewhat, you know, um, <clears throat> populated area. You may have a lot, a lot more C and D, a flooding event, you know, that actually floods uh, structures. You're going to have a lot more C and D. So you've got a couple things that come into play here. But like John mentioned, a couple of them is is your your DMSs. That's where the, your, your debris management sites, you know, are they permitted to, to, to store and to at least temporarily house this CND material so that you can get it off of the right of way, uh, reduce it, compact it, and then eventually haul it out to the final disposal site. But you've also got things to deal with as far as uh, smell goes. So you wouldn't want a DMS that's handling CND material right next to a, a large neighborhood or a, or a very populated area because you're going to be generating a lot of complaints when you have that kind of that kind of situation. So CND brings in a couple different a couple different issues that you have to kind of navigate through and you have to keep all of these in the back of your mind as you're as you're going back to the beginning of this presentation the debris the 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 planning uh as far as planning for these disasters and what debris you may encounter and what type of disaster you may encounter and how you need to handle those these are all things that are going to come into play but c and d is one that i'm sure we'll come back to a couple times throughout this this presentation no doubt um a big piece of this uh, uh especially in certain types of events where Power outages are a factor for long periods of time, which is white goods and coolant removal. I mean, you're looking at the photographs of the, you know, hundreds and thousands of white goods. And we, when we say white goods, um, we just mean those appliances, those uh, things found in your home that are generally white. Of course, we've got that 1970s lime green one right there. Uh, you got to appreciate those. Uh, found that one at grandma's place there. But uh you know, uh, for the most part, I mean, that's, again, general term. And this right here is a mixed bag. I know I've, we've seen in large debris operations with white goods. But we've also seen ones where um, some industrious folks out there within the community uh, who will who will remove them in the middle of the night type of thing. I know, you know, uh, Matt, that, that's probably the area that you never know what you're going to be dealing with. <laughs> Absolutely. And and I'll tell you, this is the one of the biggest issues with white goods in general is, is exactly what you just had on the slide there. You've got two things that come into play when you're talking about white goods. If you're talking about um, anything with refrigerant, as far as freezers, refrigerators, air conditionings, anything like that, you've got the added um, step there of handling the Freon, which of course is, is uh, you know, environmentally sensitive and you have to handle that a certain way. And there's guidelines as to how you how you remove that freon and how you dispose of that. You've also got another factor here that sometimes comes into play significantly, and that is the the, the debris, the putrescent debris that's inside these. Uh, you can see the one on the left there, that uh, refrigerator that's duct taped up. That's always a red flag. You don't want to be the first one to open that. I promise you. Um, you know, so sometimes you've got to, you know, however you're handling these white goods, and, and eventually the final disposal of these white goods, you may have to have an added step here of removing that 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 material that is inside these refrigerators and freezers before you can dispose of it. So that's just an, an added factor there that, that you have to that you have to keep in the back of your mind. Like John said, in some events, if, if there's not a significant amount of damage and, and you don't you're not seeing a huge number of white goods, sometimes this is a program that you actually never even you never even enter into. You may have a handful of them and like John said, the 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 local uh, handy recyclers will get to them before we even have a chance to get to them anyway. But it is something to keep in the back of your mind and if you do decide in, in this whatever disaster you may have uh, that that you're going to need a white goods um, <clears throat> scenario then there's a couple added steps there that you at least have to take into consideration yeah i'll tell you uh, matt you weren't kidding to be that first guy who had to open one that was one of my first jobs working in the disaster business was oversight of that particular operation i mean i was sitting there with mike Rowe, like dirty jobs like uh, uh dialing his number because you know you 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 get that uh, you get that white tail that's been you know from last season that's been sitting there for three weeks. 
uh, without um, electricity, I mean, that's a very unique smell, memorable. Uh, but moving on to e-waste, uh, certainly something we're seeing much more of, uh, especially after floods. And what we want to let you know is that, look, just have a plan for this. This is one of those really unique ones you may or may not have, just like the uh, what we saw with this, as well as HHW. Again, coordination with TCQ, uh, following guidelines, whenever you're dealing with white goods, with coolant, uh, e-waste with mercury and, and whatever else is in the CRTs, and then HHW, household hazardous waste, have a plan there. Work with the county. There may be a countywide collection. This is a great way. I mean, again, we've seen a lot of people do successful uh, drop-off site operations or assigning a special crew and doing more of a uh, hot spot to those type of uh, operations. So that's that that's that's really your your basic you know kind of the the stair step approach. What we just described is probably what we see on 75 90 percent of the debris removal operations. Um, I mean again, I'd say a hundred percent of the time or nearly hundred percent of the time you're seeing debris. Uh, but you're, I'm mean, sorry, you're seeing vegetative debris, but you're always seeing some of these are one variation. But moving on to public information, that's been so critical in providing the public and, and, and quite frankly, with the mediums that are out there, whether it's social media, a next door, a Twitter, a, a landing page. By the way, I was looking on the city of Athens uh, web page, AthensTX.org. I mean, boom, their first page was FEMA damage assessment information. I mean, on, on, on a scroll, had great ways to reach the public. And that's what we see here. You see the city of League City using um, uh, a picture there to talk about uh, debris pile segregation and uh, trying to do, do that. I've seen people do Facebook live streaming. I've seen we've seen a lot of different things here. You uh, here are some examples of crazy Twitter folks uh, following the tornadoes in Collin County in Northeast Texas. Um, I believe that was in 2016. Everything from knowing where the debris uh, was located to, you know, people's opinion about why the county isn't doing this. So you got to expect that. And you got to expect people are going to be monitoring those social media channels. Again, we look at making sure that you have a plan, providing instructions to residents on how to separate the debris and realistic updates on, hey, it's going to be a bit, you know, we want to either let the debris pile up. We want to do a clean sweep. We want to monitor those social media and rumor controls. Hey, the city's not picking it up. Well, that's not exactly true. Uh, we want to collaborate in message. Maybe there's a city and a county, you know, whether it's a, a Greg County uh, or, or you know, versus a city of Longview, where you have a large city that may want to do their own thing versus a county that may be assisting some of the smaller cities. And again, we've seen that a lot. I mean, I'll give you the fact uh, Jefferson County down in the Beaumont area. I hate picking on them, but they certainly have had their more than their fair share of disasters. That's what how they handle it. The county pick, the county addresses everything in the smaller cities like the Gnomes and the Chinas, uh, some of those small unincorporated areas, and then each of the cities handle their own. And however, they all work collaboratively. Um, again, uh, this is some basic information on some emergency procedures for set out of debris. You know, keeping it away from higher fire hydrants. Don't mix with household garbage. All of these things can be seen online, and really, this is something that HGAC put out. Uh, HGAC, Houston Galveston Area Council, has developed this right here. It's a flyer in both English and Spanish. They did a, and Brian, what were the length of the videos? And those were both in English and Spanish too. Do you remember that? And, and maybe you could put the link in the chat. Yes, I can. Yeah, so uh, HGC also worked on putting that video together. That was about, I think it's like three minutes or maybe a little less than that long. It wasn't wasn't too long. A video that describes the uh, I mean, why it's important to separate debris and um, uh, you know kind of showed an ex a practical example on the screen of, of uh, you know how to do it. 
And so real informative, very simple type of uh, video that can be shown to the public and uh, so they understand the importance of separating debris. We've seen it used on public access. We've seen it used on a city's YouTube embedded uh, video, a Twitter feed, a, a Facebook. Um, all of that information has been critical. Matt, any any successful public information campaign that stands out from your perspective? Absolutely. And I, and I tell you, this is one of those things that you every event is, is different. A number one and, and two, just with social media evolving and the different types of social media and what's available it, it's constantly evolving. I mean, now we're seeing more of this uh, this TikTok and these other like short video, you know, minute long or whatever the case may be. And I'll tell you, this is a great way. This is something that seems like almost every uh, client <laughs> municipality, whether it be large or small kind of deals with is is uh, and you mentioned it on the previous slide is getting politicians involved and that's important because you have these council members or commissioners or whatever the case may be and then they want to they want to get out there and they want to get in front of the camera or they want to go meet with their constituents whatever the case may be but give the, giving them this good information that they can put out there you know you got to control the message that's going out there and 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 i'm not saying keep them off of off of you know, social media or off of the news or media or whatever the case may be, but let's 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 direct the narrative and let's give them these tools, whether it be uh, we have filmed shows out in the field of showing examples of uh, separating debris, um, bags of debris and how to handle those. Um, I mean, I have filmed shows with with, uh, you know, commissioners and city councilmen, mayors, whatever the case may be. But really, it's it's taking that. And, and sometimes you, every count, every government's a little bit different. Sometimes there's a, a dedicated PIO or public information officer that helps direct that. But but getting your arms around that public message and kind of directing that narrative is very, very important, especially from the beginning. Um, and there's a way to get everybody involved and keep them involved. It's just a matter of making sure that they have the right information and, and they're putting that that out there. The other important thing that John mentioned, I'll just mention again, is is managing expectations. That's a big thing. Uh, these these residents, you're going to see it kind of go in different stages and depending on the severity of the event of the event. At first, they're not worried about debris because they, they don't have power. They don't have air conditioning. They're worried about where they're going to get their food and water tonight and tomorrow. So they're, they, nobody really cares about debris. But after that power starts coming back on and after their AC comes back on and they've been working on the weekends in their yard, getting it cleaned up, that's when you're going to start seeing those phone calls start to pick up. But when when's, when am I going to see a truck? When I've seen them around town, but when is it going to be on my street? And, uh, and John mentioned it, but it's important to manage those expectations and say, hey, we are in the area. We're working. We do have a plan. Here's the plan. But realistically, it could be a couple of weeks before we get to you. But but be patient. We are coming. And also, you know, the, depending on the severity of the event, there will be uh, another pass. So if you missed the first one, that's OK. We're going to come back and, and hit you again. So managing those expectations and, and managing that message is very important from the get go. I'd love to see Matt on TikTok. I just. <laughs> I can't. I can't wait to see. I can't wait to see Matt's TikTok. No, I listen. I love that idea. I love the idea of using social media. I mean, I think it's organic. I think it's relatable. I think it can show you actually how to do stuff. I mean, I would love to see. You know. Uh, um, you know. Again, this this camera is. I mean, this 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 device is in the hands of. I don't know percentages, but a lot of people. And. And to to see the the crews working, I mean, it's it's some powerful messages and some powerful visuals. Also, are debris management sites. Hopefully, I mean, if you've ever seen one of these debris management sites, it's a thing of beauty. It pops up overnight, and it's immediately handling millions and millions or thousands and thousands of cubic yards of debris. I mean, this is probably one of the most critical things. Not, I mean, probably more so than actually getting the trucks here there is or, or just as important as getting the trucks is having a place for them to store the debris and to get things in and out very very quickly i mean you got to look at the consider right you got to select these sites you don't want it to be in the middle of town you don't want it to be right next to a school if you can help it you know public land versus private land i mean you look at some of the statistics here but we've got some really good photographs here but on this one what you don't want to forget is coordination with the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality and the Texas Historical Commission. You can find information on the TCEQ website on this. Um, and, and I think there is a, uh, a process for, um, for each disaster going through the, the permitting and regulating process 
but uh, TCQ had a great website after Hurricane Harvey where they identified the location of each of the debris, uh, debris management sites across the um, across the span of the entire Texas Gulf Coast and even beyond. I think there were at one time more than 300 debris management sites that they were monitoring and tracking. And I mean, it was it was impressive, very, very impressive. Here are some things that you want to think about when you set up a debris management site, everything from pre-site photography to recording physical features and collecting any soil or water samples uh, that you may need. And in addition to that, you want to also uh, determine your reduction method versus chipping and grinding or incineration. Uh, and here is a, a, a debris management site preparation. I mean, this is a, a, FEMA, um, a FEMA model that they had uh, developed. Again, I think the big pieces of here is having good ingress and egress, having your flagman and your tower, which is going to be uh, um, where those sites are graded, having a vegetative area, construction area. You know, there's some basic features of the debris site. But you know what? The photographs really uh, tell a, a, a thousand words there, um, and and this is one there. I mean, uh, Matt, this was down in, in Hilton Head, I believe, or uh, it, it, South Carolina, or I'm not sure where this was located. I believe so. It does look like South Carolina. And you can see here, this is a perfect example of a little snapshot of what's going on here at the DMS and all the moving parts and pieces, you know. So you've got the, the debris hauling trucks that are actually coming in from, from being out in the field, in the neighborhoods. So they're coming under this scissor lift that you see here. And, and we're going to get more into this process a little bit, I think, further on in the presentation. But there, that's where the, these loads are getting graded and, and the cubic yardage, of which is, of course, how the contract contractor is being paid. Um, that's where these, these loads are getting graded. So then you have to have room for those trucks to, to, to come into the site safely. Um, you, they've got to be able to unload safely, you know, and then you've got, especially after the first maybe week or two, immediately, depending on the size of the site, you got to start reducing this material. So a lot of these sites aren't big enough to, to store months of material. So pretty quickly, you've got to start, whether it be uh, chipping, mulching, grinding, or like like John said, in some, in some cases, permitting uh, allowed, of course, uh, would be the incineration and burning of this material. But you've got that operation that has to be able to go on concurrently and, and do it safely. Um, and then at the same time, what you see there in the background, those larger semi type trucks, that those are actually hauling out the material, which of course is the next phase of all of this. After the material gets reduced, uh, in this case, they're chipping it, they're mulching it. So now that mulch has to go to the final disposal site. So you've got the trucks still coming in, bringing in the material from, from the right of way. You've got the operation, the actual uh, activity of the reduction itself happening on the site. And now you bring into an, another factor into this equation, which is those large semi trucks hauling out that mulch to the final disposal site. So this is, this is important. All these things to be aware of and kind of keep in the back of your mind when you're looking at debris management sites, uh, potentially where they're located, uh, the size of them, uh, how many you plan on opening uh, on any certain kind of event. Um, and then there's, of course, the environmental things that you have to take into consideration too. Like what's right on the other side of those trees? Is it a large neighborhood? Is it a school? Is it a hospital? And, and what are the impacts? Obviously, this can be a, a, a noisy, loud, uh, sometimes dust and dirt flying around. You've got air quality issues. You know, there's a lot of things to take into consideration when you're talking about placement of these DMSs. So this is a great snapshot of at the height of, a, of an event and the debris management operations. This is what any one DMS could look like at any time. You know, Matt, I mean, this you could break this thing down like the Zapruder film, you know, I mean, you got the flagman here, you got the barriers here. Look at the all weather road. They 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 were having rain. They took all this chip. They spread it out so these trucks weren't going to get stuck. They're saving the logs over here. They may have a market for that. Um, you got your barriers. You got your supervisor. He just showed up in the truck. They're stacking the material here, get a little bit more. They probably are space constrained. He's stacking the chips a little bit higher, but he's got a kind of wind road here. Uh, you got the scissor lift and he's wearing a safety vest, hard hat, all those things. I mean, honestly, I'd like this. I mean, this will really show you how. And and as you can tell, you got to keep the public out of this thing. You, this is a absolute war zone. When this thing starts humming, you got trucks coming in and out. I mean, Matt, what's the most trucks inbound that you guys have, have done? I mean, y any idea? Um, I got to be hundreds and thousands, hundreds oh. or thousands. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's nothing for us to process incoming, you know, uh, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 loads per day. You're talking about that's the you may have one, two, I've even seen three entrance towers working consecutively with handling these incoming trucks. So you may have trucks kind of like this picture shows here. You may have trucks coming both sides of that inspection tower or that scissor lift. So you, you have you have, let's say, three towers at three different entrances. And now you're talking two lanes coming in. The, the processing of this material is, is incredible. And, and like I said, just as Lake Charles is an example, just recently, we were handling, I mean, you could do the math, but 60, 70,000 yards of debris per day coming into these debris management sites. Uh, it, it is an incredible and, and quite impressive, actually, to, to watch these contractors and watch them set these sites up. And then once it's fully, once it's fully moving, it, it is, a, it is a, a heck of an operation to witness for sure. For sure. And so then it gets into the reduction. A lot of people in our, your rural areas will do air curtain incineration or open burning, you know, in coordination again with TCQ and local laws. You could do chipping and grinding. Um, but, you know, either way you do this, you got to be careful because uh, these chippers could throw a tooth. Those teeth in the chippers, no fooling, they're about the um, size of the palm of your hand, probably. Or, um, they're huge and they'll launch. Um, you hit it the wrong way, that'll launch. Um, I was in Escambia County, Florida, Pensacola area. One went through, it was like a missile through somebody's roof, landed right next to this little old lady on her couch. She was watching Wheel of Fortune and, um, and she just, I mean, she thought it was a meteor and it just uh, turned out to be a, a but so. Again, the setbacks really, really important. Keeping them away from airport schools. Um, whenever you're uh, cooking with fire, there, I mean, you got ash, and you know it could light this stuff on fire. We've dealt with that a lot too. Of course, there's recycling operations. Uh, a lot of steel metal out there. Uh, but at the very end, we want to divert this material from the waste stream. Um, that's number one. And Matt, I'm sure you've had your fair share of. Uh, places where they've taken it. Give us some examples of where this material has gone. Yeah, definitely. And I'll tell you, there's more and more opportunities uh, coming available. It seems like different different uh, manufacturing and, and other scenarios that they, they're trying to find ways to use this material. The two biggest that I'll kind of speak to, at least from my experience, is uh, a lot of landfills love to use this mulch as cover. For their, for their landfills and for their closure operations. So a lot of times we are hauling this material to the landfill, but it's not getting dumped into the, the cells themselves. They're actually using it as what we call beneficial cover. And that's kind of a win-win. You're not paying to dispose of it, A number one, which is a, an added benefit to the local government there, not having to foot that bill. But you're also, you're, you're, it's being used for good. You know, that, that, that cover material would have to come from somewhere. So why not use this debris that's uh, it's just a result of the, the latest disaster. The other thing that we're seeing more in like South Florida and some of those areas, but is, is, is waste to energy. So you've got some, uh, some energy places and, and other recycling type scenarios where they'll actually take this material and burn it um, to produce energy. So to produce steam, to produce energy. So that, that's, that's becoming more and more uh, in, every day. Um, there's more and more opportunities to use this material and use it just so it doesn't, uh, doesn't go to waste. Sorry, thanks, Matt. Um, the oversight and debris monitoring piece of this um, I cannot be understated. This is something of a QA, QA, QC function, actually having individuals out in the field to verify that the work is being done. Um, FEMA, as part of their requirements, uh, requires that any contract debris operations be monitored and to ensure that the work is being claimed as accurate and eligible. Um, and again, by not monitoring, you are jeopardizing your uh, uh, federal funding for that work. And again, we've seen it done many ways. We've seen it done internally with staff that's diverted from other operations. Uh, we've seen it done through a contracted mechanism. Uh, we've seen it done through mutual aid. So anytime you can have oversight, though, of your debris operations, that is the most ideal and required in contracted ones. Here is an example of a debris monitor out there um, monitoring the debris removal collection. Um, that is, he is standing uh, appropriately away from the 
the vehicle himself. You have their collection monitoring. You have folks in the towers. You can see another example of some scaffolding that was built where the trucks are running under the scaffolding. Uh, and over the last five, seven years or so, maybe 10 now, is that the industry has moved toward electronic ticketing. I mean, you've heard the phrase, there's an app for that, and this is no uh, different. There is an app for debris monitoring operations. It does everything from collect the information at the truck certification. It can print tickets. You have these things called little zebra printers. Those are, um, you know, printers that uh, uh, you see at returning your rental car, heat transfer paper, those sorts of things. Um, and you can, uh, we've seen applications on Android platforms as well as iPhone platforms. Um, and, you know, uh, you can see there, it's, it's, it's basically become the norm. It used to be these paper tickets that had carbon copies, a five part ticket, but now everything's electronic. You can catch everything from your dots on a map, where you collected to where the trucks are. I mean, you got everything here. You can, you can, you can put, uh, you know, what type of debris, vegetative versus construction management. Um, this is an example of uh, debris removal operations in city of Westlake, Louisiana. Um, you can pull specific information. So if you get a call, let me tell you what. Let me tell you what you can do with this. If you get a call, let's see where we're at. We're Garden Street. That's one, two, three, four, five Garden Street. You see these blue dots. Miss Johnson sits on that street, okay? And she's calling up and she's telling her county commissioner or her city councilman or um, your public works director, nobody has come to pick up debris on my street. I mean, you know that's going to happen. Or if it has happened or if it hasn't happened, it's going to happen. And you could say, well, ma'am, hold on. And you're going to pull up this map. It's a, a lot of folks have these little geo portal maps is what they call them. And you can say, well, ma'am, actually, they have picked up on your street and they picked up on this date at this time. You know, we're going to send the truck back again. But you can really this type of data. I mean, as many, many uses. Matt, I know you've been using this for about 10 years. Um, I mean, a real game changer, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is the, by far, like, uh, I think it's safe to say that when we, especially a client that maybe hasn't done disaster debris management in a while, when you show them this program, it, it's, it's very impressive. And, and I love showing it off. You've got, just like you said, I mean, you can tie this down to an exact I can tell you that a debris pile was picked up. I can give you GPS coordinates of that pile. I can give you dates, times, which truck number, which contractor, which subcontractor, all the way down to the driver of that truck for each individual pile that's picked up. It's it's, it's definitely a game changer. And, and what it does is it pulls all of this information that we've covered so far. So we started with the truck certifications and the pictures of those trucks and the cubic yardages of those trucks is now into the system itself. And now you're tying that with the monitor that's out in the field with that truck and the debris piles and the GPS locations of those piles. And then you're following that truck to the to the DMS location where the, that ticket is actually closed out. And what it's doing is it's taking all of that data, all those data points, putting them together and and into a very user friendly and, and more importantly, a FEMA friendly uh, a document. And in a package that we can put together and, and, and present to your, yourself, the client, or to whoever it may be, and eventually, of course, to FEMA. But this is going to cover all of those requirements that, that FEMA is going to require you to have. And it's very user friendly and also very, very, um, it's customizable, which is a beautiful thing. So, what you see in front of you here is one of the, this is just happens to be our, our, um, Tetratex ADMS system. It's called Recovery Track, but this is a daily report that you would get every single night. So you're we reconciling our data. Unlike John mentioned, the, the old the old days with paper tickets, where, where you're constantly reconciling over days and weeks, uh, trying to play catch up. We're reconciling our data real time every single day. So each night or first thing in the morning, you're going to get a report of those. Uh, you can see it broken down there to the total cubic yardages that was hauled broken down between the C and D material and the vegetative and woody. And then you can you can customize these reports. I mean, it's incredible uh, the amount of customizable. If you say, hey, I, I need to see this or I want it to look like that. You know, you can, you've got that um, flexibility to make to customize these reports. And ultimately, where it really makes a difference is this is all of this, even through the invoicing part of the project 
is what brings it all together. So as we're getting those invoices and invoicing starts flowing, we're making sure that QA, QC of what's in the system, what has been monitored, matches what the contractor has, and, and ultimately, you know, it's that final product, which is, of, which is of course, the most important. Hey, and Matt, one of the things that I was going to tell the audience is a lot of this stuff, you can take the API and put it in your own website. So if you want to tell people where the drugs are, if you want to tell people where, where they've been, you can do that. And, and or you can use these reports to tell people, you know, hey, this is where we've been, where we are, where we're going. And uh, uh, and tell people, hey, we're we're 65 percent of the way there. We're kicking butt. And uh, and, and this information, which used used to could I mean, you really didn't have a chance to do that. Now you can tell people and really be proactive in pushing information out. From a debris monitoring operations, it's a very well-worn path. Um, this is uh, FEMA just released new for 2021 debris monitoring guide. Just gives you the basics of you know uh, out there. Um, you know ratios for inspectors to I mean supervisors to uh, monitors where you need to be monitoring roving monitors. You know those sorts of things. So um, debris monitoring guide uh, hyperlinked here. Um, you can uh, you, you can show this and um, but pretty basic stuff 50 page document be good to just you know print up and uh, you can kind of scroll through it talks about roles and responsibilities so on and so forth so um, handy dandy tool uh, for you to uh, plan for the future so with the last five minutes or so we're going to talk about specialized debris removal operations and probably the one area the specialized one that we're going to spend the most time is leaners and hangers our leaning tree and hanging limbs and matt you've done more of these than you could shake a stick at they're always a challenge um you want to talk through that here yeah absolutely so like john said this is a huge part of what we do so you've got the debris removal operations in the right of way which is probably the biggest and then right behind that is going to be what what we what we call and, and if you hear me refer to leaners and hangers that's what we're talking about so we're talking about leaning trees and we're talking about hanging limbs okay uh the fema is very specific over over the guidelines and the requirements for these hazards and, and what they have to be uh to to do this a couple things here one this is going to be one of the most expensive programs that that's going to happen and and, and as far as a debris removal operation goes this is one of the most costly um it is very highly scrutinized uh it's highly monitored we have uh, a lot of monitors, a lot of supervisors keeping eyes on this operation, uh, as well as as well as other other eyes. And everybody's going to be looking at the leaners and hangers, and they always are. So it's important to know this program. And and I'll tell you, I don't think there's been a disaster that we haven't had, at least to some degree, some leaners and hangers uh, in this operation goes. So if you go to the next slide, John, I think it talks about. Yeah, here we go. The requirements. So when you're talking about a. a a hazardous tree, what, what does that mean? Um, FEMA is very specific. So it's got to have a diameter of six inches or greater, and that's measured four and a half feet above the ground level of the tree. So you can't measure the very bottom at the thickest part of the trunk. And, and we're not talking about up high in the tree either. Four and a half feet above the ground, it's got to be at least six inches. Um, and then and there's basically, here's what, what, what makes it a hazardous tree. It has a split trunk. It has a broken or damaged canopy and it's leaning at an angle greater than 30 degrees. So if it meets one of those requirements, it qualifies as a hazardous tree and under the FEMA program can be removed. Uh, typically the way they see this work is uh, in, in the contracts with the haulers is usually on a, a size basis. So there may be three or four different categories. Let's say there's a, a category, a, a unit rate for say six to 12 inches, and then another rate for 12 to 24, 24 to 36, 36 to 48, something like that is usually how we see. And so they're paid on a per tree basis typically. Um, in the same boat, you've got the, maybe the tree itself is not hazardous, but maybe that tree has been damaged to the point where there's some hazardous limbs in the tree. Um, this is the next phase of that when you talk about a hanger. Uh, so it's, once again, there's a size requirement. It's got to be two inches or greater. It's got to be a hazard to the public right of way. So it's got to be in the right of way. We can't go onto private property and remove these, not under this program at least. And then it's got to uh, pose an immediate threat. Okay. And it's got to be like, like I said, it's got to extend over the right of way. It's got to be a hazard to that sidewalk, to the street, to cars parked on the street, uh, school, um, bus stops, 
whatever the case may be, it does have to be a hazard there to the public right away. So, um, and once again, these are usually paid on a unit rate basis uh, per tree. So in the old days, it used to be there were some kind of different ways of handling this. And sometimes you saw it as actually as a per hanger basis, but we've gotten away from that to where it's actually a per tree unit rate basis now. So really, if there is one limb or 20 limbs in a tree, you're still paying for that one, right? That's right. That's right. So they'll get paid per the tree and, and they're, they're expected to clean all of the hazards and hazards out of that tree for that cost. Exactly. How about on the stump side? Matt. Yeah, so the same thing. It, it usually goes along the same the same program with the leaners and hangers. You've got hazardous stumps. Uh, and once again, FEMA is very, very clear on the requirements. What what makes a stump hazardous? So it's got to have 50% or more of the root ball exposed, and it's got to be greater than two feet or larger in diameter when measured two feet from the ground. It's got to be located within the right-of-way, and it's got to, once again, pose an immediate threat to public health and safety. So you can see the general message here and everything in the FEMA guidelines is very clear. It's got to be a hazard. It's got to be in the right of way. I mean, we're talking about everything that's in the right of way and it's got to be storm generated. You know, it's got to be generated from the, the, the storm. It can't be something that's been that way for 20 years. And now you're just going to take advantage and go remove that stump that's been bothering you. It's got to be storm generated materials. But you can see everything comes back to the general public health and safety. And that's very, very important to stay focused, both from the, the monitoring, from the haulers, from the, the local government, whatever the case may be, when identifying these, these hazards, got to be a public health and safety issue. So you can see here this, you know, we're just talking about right away primarily up to this point. There are some other things that, that qualify and come into play when you're talking about debris removal. And the, the probably the biggest area outside of the right away that comes into play is the parks and recreational areas. Um, usually for a couple of reasons. For most of the time, they're the most heavily wooded. Um, you've got, uh, whether it be playground equipment, you may have ball fields, baseball fields, football fields, soccer fields. You may have walking trails. Uh, whatever the case may be, you've got an area that is public use. It's free and open to public use. And you've got the the hazard to the general public there. There's no question about it. You know, these, these limbs, these trees, they could fall and hurt somebody. Uh, they could damage public infrastructure, whether it be streets, sidewalks, equipment, buildings, whatever the case may be. So there are, uh, you know, this is another part, another program that, depending on the, the disaster, could come into play. And it's something to keep in the back of your mind when you're talking about debris management planning, for sure. Thanks so much. So what we'll do is um, let's take a 10 minute break and uh, then come back with uh, one of the more unique aspects of the program, which is the private property debris removal by the official watch invested in me. I have 10 a.m. on the dot. So we'll take 10 minutes. If you, we'll mute everybody's line and then come back at 1010 and we'll talk through private property and uh, some other other aspects of debris management operations. Thanks everybody for your attention so far. Talk to you soon.
All right. Thanks, everybody, for uh, coming back. Um, I see we've got uh, about 20 people. Again, thanks so much for, to the East Texas Council of Governments for hosting today's webinar, as well as the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality for funding uh, this uh, very valuable uh, planning tool. Hopefully, so far, we've highlighted some things you may not have thought about or reconfirmed some things that keep you up at night. One of the things that people often don't quite think about um, until you have a big event is the private property debris removal program where the actual local government assists individuals who for whatever reason can't remove the debris off of their pro or off of their property it might be just that it's too much and overwhelming it might be that the that they're elderly um, it might be beyond what a faith-based organization can do in, in some way shape or form uh, local government will assist, if you will, in conducting the private property debris removal mission. This is the one of the most complex as well as document intensive processes that you'll see out there. There's a few scenarios when this is going to take place when it's uh, um, really when it's widespread devastation. You can see here this photograph of the Bastrop wildfires. I think that's where I was. Uh, my first wildfire was in 2011 there in Bastrop County. And uh, you want to talk about a neat, um, you, you had a commissioner, Commissioner Clara Beckett, who's still there, by the way, great resource and a great public servant who was one of the county commissioners that really fought for the community, fought alongside the state, you know, to um, to get FEMA to approve this PPDR program or private property debris removal program and help the citizens of their community. Um, I, I know, Matt, you've been involved in a lot of these. Um, you, any story to share, war story to share on, on this and, and uh, uh, some, some things to watch out for, so on and so forth? <laughs> Yeah, so we uh, we we did a uh, a significant PPDR program after Hurricane Michael over in the Bay County area. Just actually just recently finished that up within the last month or two, uh, and we're early in the stages. Uh, we will be doing the PPDR program in in Louisiana uh, in the Lake Charles Calcasieu Parish area as well. So we're early in the stages of that, talking it through with with FEMA and, and setting up the, the program itself. So this is a, like John mentioned, this is a very, uh, it's different. A number one, it's different from what we're used to as far as the right away collections go. Um, but it's also, it's, it's pretty intense. Uh, there's a couple different things that come into play and it, it kind of brings everything that we've talked about so far all into kind of one program. Um, we actually, you've got the, re the outreach to these citizens, these affected citizens, which brings in that, that messaging, that public information, that social media, whatever the case may be, you've got to get this, this information to the general public and, and let them know about this program and, and let them know the requirements of this program and, and actually get them to, whether it be uh, call a phone number and get more information, whether it be um, go onto a website and fill out maybe a questionnaire to see if they're eligible, or in some cases, uh, like what we did in, in Hurricane Michael and what we're fixing to do in Louisiana is we actually set up physical offices and, and get this information to the general public and say, hey, come see us. Um, here's some things we're looking for, like bring us your insurance paperwork if you were insured uh, or, or, or an affidavit saying you weren't, if that's the case. Um, you know, let us know your situation. What, 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 is the, what is the extent of the damage? What does it involve? What, what's included? Is the entire house damaged? Is it, a, is it, a, is it just some, some debris, some vegetative debris, maybe some large oak trees that you need help with? Or is it in some cases, it's, it's, you're talking about a full uh, clearing of the property, meaning demolishing the home and, and everything that goes along with it. So it it's kind of brings all of this into play. And then when you actually get to the part of actually removing the material from the property itself, everything is tracked on a per property basis. So it's a little bit different where the right away program is kind of just this one giant program including all the public areas and in, in the local local area there. This is actually tracked on a per property basis. So we're tracking time, we're tracking equipment and we're tracking quantities of debris that are removed from each individual property itself. So the paperwork is, is very intensive. Uh, it's kind of a time consuming uh, process. And uh, it's also one that, you know, uh, it, 
not a whole lot of people are familiar with. Uh, uh, definitely local governments, in some cases, uh, haulers and, and monitors, some monitoring companies are not really familiar with it. Uh, and in some cases, depending on who's on the, the state and federal side, you may have some newbies there that have never done it as well. So uh, it, it can be uh, it can be a learning experience, but it is a very uh, I've seen I've seen one very successful program uh, in the in the Bay County area where this was very successful and uh, resulted in helping a lot of a lot of citizens. Well, we were no stranger to that in Texas. Uh, you've got some really good programs in Galveston County. Uh, Public Road and Bridge Coordinator Director Lee Crowder, he's a great resource. Uh, I mentioned Clara Beckett there in Bastrop County. Over in Southeast Texas, I know in Orange County and Jefferson County, if you know folks over there, you know they have been involved in these programs and it's not something that you wanna take, undertake without some professional support. And that support may come from the Texas Division of Emergency Management. It could fr come from other local governments or through um, the private sector. But if you do run into this situation, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tremendous uh, effort and one that may go on for weeks, if not months. Waterway debris, um, you know, again, something to be aware of when you are looking at different um, uh, programs uh, that are unique and specialized. If you do have bayous, uh, lakes, rivers, uh, streams, that sort of thing. Important to know here, again, this is a program you don't want to rush into. There's a lot of different reasons, but, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think we have time. We could probably do a whole workshop on waterway debris removal, uh, but want to highlight that as a unique mission. And then, of course, as we focused on starting up the operation, we focus on closeout, and that is ineligible debris along the right of way, marking that um that we see a lot of illegal dumping um matt i know illegal dumping especially in some rural communities is a big big issue um how have you guys handled like that uh, closing out of the operation and illegal dumping and and marking debris piles and so on and so forth yeah it's it's i tell you this is one of the most challenging parts of what we do because uh for a lot of reasons it, it can get out of control in a hurry and i'll tell you one of the biggest issues that we have is is the the contractors the tree contractors and, and whether it be building contractors making uh, renovations additions whatever the case may be they're charging these citizens and these residents for for hauling away the material and really all they're doing is going around the corner and dumping it in the right away so it, that 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 burden that cost falls on the local government and, and of course the hauler's responsibility to get it so it's a constant battle marking these piles trying to locate these piles where they are um, it, in some cases, we can we can catch these people, you know, uh, actually dumping in the act of dumping, and, and we actually work hand in hand with the local governments there, whether it be the the sheriff's office or the uh, the local police department. In some cases, code enforcement. Um, so this is where really the, the the team has to come together and identify this problem, identify that there's a problem, and, and try to figure out the best way to handle it and address it. So that is that is definitely one of the one of the biggest issues. And it comes into play a lot with code enforcement. I'll, I'll throw something else out there too. A lot of times what you see is home uh, home builders and developers will, will start, they see this opportunity to get some material hauled away for free. So they'll, they'll go clear cut some lots. That's something else we see a lot of, you know, they may have four or five lots that they need to clear. They're ready to build some houses and this is a perfect opportunity. Um, you know, if we deem those once, once again, I said, it's gotta be storm generated material. So if that, if that wasn't generated by the storm, it's, it's considered ineligible. So then you, then you move into the next phase of, okay, let's, we, somebody's got to reach out. And a lot of times that's the local code enforcement or, or, or whoever that task falls upon um, to go reach out to this homeowner or this resident or this contractor, whoever the case may be and, and, and get that debris addressed. And then plus on the other side of that is making sure that we ensure that we don't that by mistake or whatever that the hauler or whoever doesn't go and get those. So what you can see here is it looks like it's been marked with some spray paint um, and wrapped in some caution tape that would tell the monitors and the haulers in the field. Hey, this pile has been deemed ineligible for whatever reason. Do not pick it up. Do not haul it. Um, we've taken other actions, you know, so that that's just a couple of examples of some things we deal with as we're talking about closeout. <clears throat> the other thing that goes along with that is the closing of the roadways. To ensure that we're not leaving a problem, you know, when we do leave, uh, making sure that we hit everybody 
uh, at least once, in some cases, maybe two or three times, and making sure that all the eligible debris that's out there has been has been picked up and addressed. Uh, we don't want to leave town and, and the, the, the city or the, the town or the county, whatever the case may be, be left with a mess on their hands uh, by a bunch of missed piles. So this is where that tracking system and the GIS and the geo portal types of scenario helps us ensure that no, every roadway, every eligible roadway was hit uh, in the, you know, we're signing off and closing roads after they've been hit after that last pass has been declared. So a couple of things to keep in mind when you're talking about closeout. Yeah, certainly a lot projects are really, I mean, not to say they're easy to start up, but closing them out and closing them out the right way. And, uh, um, you know, and shaking hands and saying, Hey, we did a good job. That's what we, you know, strive for. And that's what we see as the biggest challenge because of things like ineligible debris piles. Also, post event remediation. We've seen a lot of these sites that you know looked like that at the top. We got to bring them back to their pre-existing condition, and that's a challenge, uh, especially um, you know when when it comes to seeding. I mean, uh, Matt, you want to talk about all the things to consider when you are looking at doing a you know a remediation and, and bringing it back to its pre-existing condition. Yeah, for sure. This is this is something probably one of the biggest things to keep in mind when you're talking about identifying DMS sites and potential DMS sites is 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 what is the current state of that site? Uh, what is it currently used for, if anything? Um, you know, we've had some some local governments that have uh, kind of gotten in a hurry and, and used uh, I'll, just as one example that pops in my mind is like uh, sports fields, sports complexes and ball fields thinking it's a big wide open area, no big deal, we'll go in here and we'll use it. Well, what, what happens at the end of that is now you've got the, the task and the cost of, of rebuilding that sports complex in those fields. Uh, and then usually you have, goes along with that, <laughs> some collateral damage is the, it's ready to start T-ball season or, or the football season or whatever the case may be. So it's very important to keep in mind what, what is that site? What is it currently used? What, what does it look like? Is it sodded? Is it seeded? Is, is there trees? Do we need to protect those trees that are there? So we need to flag those off and, and, and buffer those. But more importantly, when the contractor is leaving and that DMS site, it's been signed off on, it's been cleared, you know, what do we need to do to bring this back? And that may be just uh, blading it off, leveling it off and throwing down some seed. Uh, it could involve some sod. It could involve some uh, asphalt, some concrete, maybe fixing some pavement areas, some parking spaces, whatever that, that may be. It's very important to know that, that you know, what is that site and what do we expect it to look like when the contractor leaves? It's very, very important to keep that in mind. Worst debris management site uh, was that for remediation was the equestrian center the, uh, that somebody, uh, one of our clients used. And not that it was a bad site, it was a great site, but the people that use equestrian events are Lovey Howell and Thurston Howell III. You know what I mean? And and so you want to keep that in mind. I mean, you know, Matt talked about the ball field, and you're looking at um, the the Little League, uh, Little League moms and dads. You ever have to deal with this? I was a coach. I just coached my little son's Little League. This just finished up. Man, I don't want to get crossways with them. I want to keep them happy. I can just imagine I got to deal with like 10 of the moms and dads. You're talking about hundreds when you're the, the managers of ball field. So just to keep that in mind that when you're selecting these sites, you know, uh, thinking about big events and, you know, schools and, and, and uh, seasons of uh, soccer and baseball, all those sorts of things. Um, and of course, the less fun uh, piece of this is documentation of expenses. I mean, you know, the fun part is getting stuff cleaned up and getting things moving. Um, paperwork, nobody likes to talk about paperwork. Um, I don't want to say nobody. There are people out there, people that work for us that love <laughs> doing paperwork, people that probably work for you that love doing paperwork. I always tell people, Look at their, um, I always tell people, you know, when, when I try and go identify the right person for documenting the expenses, look at their laptop or desktop computer screen, like main desktop. If it's neat and organized and everything's in the right folder, that's the person you want versus 30 different little icons on their desktop, uh, perhaps like I do. Um, you know, I, I but, but you got to look at overtime hours, volunteer hours, equipment uses, rental equipment, all those contract service, having them in one place. FEMA has a great tool now, we'll talk about this a little bit later, um, called uh, Grants Portal. 
which is the the repository. Maybe some of y'all used it for some COVID related expenses or for an uh, other disaster. Uh, really great tool. State has GMS, uh, the grant management system, another great tool. So everybody's going digital. And um, and and so having a digitization of the documents is a big piece of this. That's it for some of the basic tenets of the program. We're going to go into some state and federal requirements and reimbursement under the public assistance program. We'll probably spend about 10, 15 minutes here and then go into uh, really what I think is very applicable, which is disasters that don't quite make the threshold for public assistance. So uh, TCQ here has some great information on managing debris from declared disasters. You can see the website available there. Brian, I know you've done a lot of debris management plans, especially up in the north central Texas. I know you were just doing a, a debris work, uh, um, a debris management tabletop exercise, I believe. But it, it, tell us a little bit about you know kind of the guidance that's out there and, and how local governments could adapt it and adopt it to help influence their planning efforts. Yeah, so there is quite a bit of guidance out there. Um, of course, uh, the, the federal government has uh, some good guidance. Uh, TCQ guidance has been is very useful. They put together this document managing uh, debris from declared disasters that has some good uh, practical information on uh, uh, you know disaster declarations, uh, sorting debris, uh, options for burning. I mean, just uh, just kind of going through it here. There's there's quite a bit of good basic information. It talks about debris management sites, disposal of different types of debris, uh, and so uh, there's a lot of good information there. And then if you're uh, curious about um, you know what the state is going to do overall and what their roles and responsibilities are. Uh, back in 2019, the state put out their catastrophic debris management annex to the state EOP. And so we have the link posted there to that. And it gives you uh, a lot of good information about the roles of, um, of different state agencies and how they might be there to help um, in coordinating, uh, help, help the local jurisdictions in supporting their operations in debris management. And then uh, on the next one, we have the uh, kind of the Bible of uh, public assistance program, and that's the public assistance program and policy guide. And this is the latest one we show here, effective June 1st, uh, 2020, but it changes every so often. I mean, you kind of have to watch because they, they may change it uh, year to year or maybe every other year or so, they'll make some changes to that uh, policy guide. But this is the thing that really outlines the total uh, the requirements under the uh, public assistance program. And so if you have any you know, folks who are going to be um, collecting the, uh, the documentation for reimbursement, they really need to be familiar with this, uh, this policy guide. So they're aware of what's in it and you know, also looking at hazard mitigation a uh, actions after a disaster. It also has a lot of information about that and repair facilities and that kind of information. So a very important document uh, to be familiar with after a disaster. Hey, and, and you know, 100 uh, percent, I was wanted to kind of go back to the uh, state of Texas and, you know, we talk about, about state agencies play a tremendous role. Uh, you know, it's uh, federally funded, state managed, locally delivered. You hear that a lot when it comes to disasters, but the state, you know, whether it's a Texas Division of Emergency Management, TDEM, okay, to write that one out, really super important one. Um, General Land Office, GLO, they might be involved in state-owned submerged lands or other aspects of the debris removal operations. TxDOT, Texas Department of Transportation. Um, yeah, again, you state-owned right-of-ways, state-owned roads. Heck, they've even done some missions for some local governments as well uh, to assist them through the STAR request form, and we'll, we'll get into that. Um, of course, we've talked about Texas Commission on Environment Quality, as well as the Texas Historical Commission, THC. And, you know, again, they are, there's some big players out there. Uh, oh, and even the Texas Forestry Service, when, if you do <clears throat> end up 
being impacted by a wildfire. We saw them issue a lot of guidance and support to Bastrop County, as well as some areas up in PK, uh, where that when they were de dealing with the uh, the wildfire as well, um, and and helping identify which trees were going to live, which trees were not going to live, uh, and and so on and so forth. So just just again, resources out there, a lot of great people. We live in a state that have had, you know, we've got plenty of disaster and a plenty of experience. Um, again, when you're talking reimbursement, the reimbursement has to be tied and authorized by the president under the FEMA Public Assistance Program. Uh, and different threshold, varying thresholds exist. It could be 75% federal funding, 90% federal funding, or in some cases, 100% federal funding. Um, when it gets again regulatory debris management sites and um, i'll pull this link up just so everybody can see the uh, texas commission on environmental quality um, four page document here again um, you can find this online and submit it to the state and and brian i know you've worked with uh, tcq and and uh, everybody's been, been real responsive and and uh, you've any, any things to watch out for on the, or people should be aware of on the form here? Yeah, so you just, uh, you know, fill out the form completely. You know, it's got the, you know, questions they ask about the, the site you're uh, looking at complete um, using. And so you complete that and then you forward it to the, the regional office and uh, provide it to them and they will review the form and get back with you uh, if they have any questions about it and provide that approval uh, in for the debris management site that you're uh, looking at. Yeah, so just provide it to them mm -hmm. uh, and show that uh, the local government has approved, you know, that that potential site uh, before it uh, goes to uh, the uh, TCEQ and then they also need to check in with the Texas Historical Commission and a lot of times they will have the, uh, a form specifically designed for the incident and so um, you know you'll have there's a form that you complete for them and, and, and uh, send to them as well the information uh, you know the contact information is on the form that you send to the um, uh, Texas Historical Commission for them to get their approval as well. And here's the one for DR 4332, which is Hurricane Harvey, a very similar form to the TCQ form, simpler, but you got to make sure you're putting the right information here and submitting it. Um, and again, this is a big one before beginning debris removal work. This is super important. So please make sure you get this done and that there's no environment environmental issues, nothing uh, that you're, you're dealing with there. And contracts, um, but really the, the lightning rod of the debris industry is contracting to CFR 200, um, which is not Greek, it, it's not, not Greek letters, it's, it's Title II of the Code of Federal Regulations, Chapter 200. Um, and and it's the rules in which these contracts are governed by. If you plan to seek federal reimbursement, listen again. One of these topics I could do a whole session on, or we, you know we could we could talk about till we're blue in the face. And I I but it's incredibly important. FEMA, this is write this one down. FEMA has the Procurement Disaster Assistance Team, or PDAT. There's a great website there. You can pull that up. It's it's really good stuff and can tell you what basic information you want uh, to include. How do you want to procure it? How do you want to procure it? And really set you on the right path um, with getting a good contract in place. Again, talking to CFR 200, these are essential elements of the procurement. Matt, I mean, of the of the things that you see here in, in debris haulers, you've worked with a lot. Any um, anyone stand out to you to say, hey, you know, uh, what do you what do, what do you want to look for in a in a, in a debris hauler? 
Yeah, I'll tell you, there, there's a couple of things that come into play, but but the biggest thing, I mean, there, there's the these guys that, that do this, these disaster debris haulers, there, there's some big companies that have been doing this a long time. Um, you want to look at, you want to look at past experience for sure. You, you don't, you're in the middle of a disaster. You've just been hit with this, this huge storm, whatever the case may be. You don't, you don't need that to be this this storm to be this hauler's first first job um <laughs> you don't want a newbie that's never done it before uh, you want to look at past experience you want to be see look at their qualifications look at their references i'll tell you i've had more clients that have uh <clears throat> that have learned some important and valuable lessons just based on references and checking those references and doing a good job and doing your doing your due diligence on on researching these companies um, yes. I mean, you do have to, obviously competition's huge. You know, you're going to get uh, a lot of these guys kind of prey on these, uh, these disasters. So a disaster comes through the area and you're going to have a, an influx of, uh, of contractors coming and trying to meet with you and say, Hey, I'll, I'll get out there and clear those streets for you, or I'll get out there and start hauling or whatever the case may be. It's just very, very important. Like John said, to, to follow the rules, fi- follow the, the guidance that's out there. Okay. There's a lot of guidance. The uh, CFR basically spells it out for you. Um, it, but you want to make sure just a couple things here that it mentions, which is all good points, a clear and definitive scope of work. There's examples out there that you can look at and, and it kind of defines those scopes, not just for the haulers, but for the monitors as well. Um, and then the financial records is a huge part. This is a very, very expensive program. Uh, it's probably going to be, depending on the disaster, it's pretty safe to say it's going to be your largest dollar amount, uh, you know, line item that you're going to have at, after a disaster is the debris removal costs and operations of that. Um, these companies have got to be able to withstand that and, and have the financial wherewithal to, to make it through there. Um, you know, proof of insurance and bonding, of course, is, is self-explanatory. Uh, they've got to be a legitimate. Um, some some local governments require them to be contractors, um, whether it be general contractors or whatever the state may require there. Uh, that can be helpful, especially when it comes to the, the insurance and bonding requirements. Um, but I'll tell you, the biggest thing is, and, and I think John can maybe even speak to this a little bit more, but uh, you, you don't want to make a snap decision and, and get uh, the local contractor there and, and get him under contract under some... Uh, scope of work and negotiation that was done on a napkin uh, it's going to come back and bite you later for sure yeah definitely uh napkins are are good for you know the the beginnings of writing a country song they're they're not good for starting and uh, doing a million dollar contract with somebody so uh we've seen a lot of brother-in-law deals i mean i hate to paint that in that picture but um that's something we've seen a lot of focus and attention on uh, with the FBI, with the investigative um, group within the Office of Inspector General. So uh, be very, very aware and be very, very careful of that. Um, so then finally, force account costs. Uh, this is when we say force account labor, what we mean there is the time associated with public uh, staff that is public sector staff that's dedicated to this. So whether you're a school district who's having to deal with this, a maintenance crew of, of a parks department or public works department um, or administration, you have the ability to recover some of your costs in the event of a declared disaster. Um, volunteer hours and activities, use of equipment, rental equipment, those sorts of things are all eligible expenses as part of this program. So something to be very, very aware of um, and lots of good information out there on the web on this. But this is really one thing that I don't think is on the web so much, and it's how to handle debris when there's not a declared disaster, because this is the big challenge. Listen, we live in a big state. I mean, the great state of Texas, and we're only getting bigger, and it's only getting more difficult to get a disaster declaration. Case in point is the uh, the current disaster, the winter storm. Uh, we got category B declared very, very fast, and it's taken some time to get the other categories of work declared. I think one disaster in 2019 last year or two years ago took 164 days to declare. And they're not always going to be quote unquote no brainer disasters. So, what are we talking about here? We're talking about 2003 Paris, Texas. Huge ice storm, no disaster declaration. And you have to deal with it yourself. 2019, tropical storm Imelda. It was declared, but not for public assistance and not for debris removal. And then uh, the one I mentioned in 2018, the severe winter storms, it was not declared a disaster. I was wrong, not 160, it was 140 days. Um, so these are all real considerations that 
you in the East Texas Council of Governments area should be thinking about. And, you know, whether you're, you know, a Camp County, a 12,000 population or an Anderson County, you got the county and then you have a big city like Palestine in, in the middle of it. Um, you you want to look at what options you have to deal with debris. Number one option, well, it really isn't an option, is always keep your records. There's always something that either the legislature could do with funding a disaster or FEMA could come in weeks, if not months later, and uh, um, allow you to seek reimbursement for these expenses. So don't forget your contracting expenses and your force account expenses. Just because it's not declared now doesn't mean it won't be declared in the future. <laughs> leverage the star request form, Le Re bleh. leverage the star request process where you can reach out to other local governments. The city may be able to provide mutual aid. It might be able to provide assistance to other communities. We saw the star request process and mutual aid for debris removal work very successfully after Hurricane Harvey in the state or in the city of Houston when some other communities like Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio and Austin all sent crews down. Assistance can from the state can be requested. We've also seen it through Texas Department of Transportation. They respond through the star request form and they provide additional crews out there that again can be force multipliers. Again, a little bit on the star request process um, through the disaster district chairman and then on up through the state operations center. Again, this is a process that moves very, very fast. It just needs to start at you know the local level and work its way up when you determine the disaster debris is beyond your ability to handle. Again, visually, the star request process. Uh, Brian, anything to highlight here um, when it comes to um, the star request process? Yeah, so it's just working through the the channel. So you know, local uh, jurisdiction will go to the county, and then the county will work through the uh, uh, district uh, disaster district office. And uh, actually, I used to be one of those people that would sit in the disaster uh, district office at times uh, in the middle of a big table, and uh, the phone would ring, and hoping it wouldn't be for me. But uh, it's one of those deals where you know you have all the folks in the region, you know, representing different agencies are there, and if the resources are in the in the in that region in the community, uh, you know, kind of have a, try to have a hand on uh, and handle on what all the different resources are in the community there and in the in the region, and so we really try, you know, or we would really try uh, to find those resources regionally if possible. But then if not, then, you know, we reach up to the state level. Uh, if it's a, a medical issue, then it would uh, go to the uh, state medical operations center uh, with uh, uh, Texas uh, uh, health um, dishes, uh, Texas yeah, health. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, the, you know, go up to them. And then also uh, or the Texas Forest Service. So, you know, it goes up to the state from there if, if they're able to fill it. And then if not, you know, then, then it might go to FEMA. So anyway, just kind of keeping that that uh, system in place for, um, you know, the, the process for requesting resources and, and following those steps uh, to make sure that your your resources are, you know, you have a good handle on what you need. Uh, I've worked in uh, situations where go, well, we need uh, we need helicopters. And, well, how many do you need? Do you need pilots for them? Where are you going to refuel them? And, you know, kind of thinking through some of those details when you have a request that you're pushing up uh, through the through the system. Well, let me tell you, uh, when you make that mutual aid, especially when it comes to debris operations, asking how long they're going to be there and who's responsible for the hotel? And where are they going to stay? Do they have their own maintenance crews? I mean, you've seen these debris trucks. If you're in public works, you know a hydraulic hose is going to break at least once a day on these vehicles or an AC or something along those lines. Uh, there's just too many moving parts and and uh, on this debris. And, and picking up debris has a lot of wear and tear. So being aware of that and, and asking the right questions uh, is a really big, big part of this.
All right. All right, new for 2021, uh, breaking news type stuff out here is the PSAT tool, which is the Public Assistance State of Texas assessment tool. Something that was rolled out for the winter storm and something that's gonna continue to evolve. I think if you did have impacts from the winter storm 21 or DR 4543, I think that was the, the disaster number. You're probably familiar with this. And and uh, making sure that you quickly get the damages up through the PSAT tool and also into the state's NAS tool. Um, working with uh, some of the other regional coordinators are, we're all, you know, again, I think a lot of local governments are getting more familiar with this pro program and familiar with the tools and the tool belt. What I'm saying here is that it's up to the local governments to provide information and transparency to the state through the PSTAT tool and making sure that, you know, again, this is, again, ultimately going to replace the DSO, the Disaster Summary Outline. Again, it's a, we're in a transition period, but I can't stress enough that in those disasters where you're dealing with debris, don't forget to report your damages, put your cost estimates together, and make sure you are pushing that up. I think you know, and um, because a, a lot of this is is going to take some time. They're not always automatic disasters where you know you're going to receive those federal funds. I would argue more times than not, local governments are left waiting 30 to 45 days trying to figure out if a disaster is going to be declared versus ones that are going to happen happen in a couple three days not saying always but something to be aware of just because we're such a huge state i think a big piece of this is also keeping your elected officials advised and apprised of the status of the cost and the operation and so where i'm going with this is that there's you know if you are a local government and i mean let's face it the federal assistance allows you to do more things that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise, like bring in big labor forces of contractors and not have the, the tremendous hit on your fund balance or on your enterprise fund or what have you. Um, so, you know, being transparent to say, hey, listen, this is going to be a million bucks or $5 million, those sorts of things, I mean, that's a big, big thing. Or if you're going to tell your elected officials, no, we're not cleaning up debris. You saw that information from you saw that tweet from the city uh, from collin county after the tornado there they drew a line in the ground line in the sand stake in the ground one of those things uh flag on the moon that they were not going to pick up debris and you gotta tell folks that i was in altus oklahoma big air force base it's in the western side of oklahoma um almost parallel with uh, the uh, Amarillo and you know it was Lawton was picking up debris and Oklahoma City was picking Norman was doing they had an ice storm and Alta said no we're just not doing it and finally they acquiesced this was the elected body and um, and then also had, took a big position on um, leaners and hangers you heard from Matt earlier about um, leaners and hangers and how critical that was uh, and how expensive it is. And, you know, I think um, I think being transparent with elected officials is uh, huge, huge, especially in those non-declared events. One of the things, and Matt, you know, I, I know you've got a lot of experience with this, is residential drop-off sites. This is something that we've seen a lot, used a lot, uh, with some, some varying degrees of success in communities. You want to take us through that? Yeah, absolutely. This is uh, this plays right into what you were just talking about. You know, hey, well, what are we going to do? Are we going to pick up debris? Are we not going to pick up debris? Uh, do we have, has it been declared? Are we going to be able to bring in contractors or not? You know, a lot of these, you know, smaller municipalities, smaller counties, they may not have the manpower. They may not have the equipment to, to, to handle all of this and to get out there and cover such a large remote, you know, say county or whatever that's spread out over, you know, hundreds of miles. You know, so you have to look at other options. And one of the biggest options is, and one of the easiest ones, is to is to do what we call residential drop-off sites. So you identify a couple of sites geographically, 
um, you know, spread out. Maybe you've got one in the, each of the four quadrants, if you will, or maybe a north and a south part of the city, whatever the case may be, whatever makes sense. And you identify a couple of these and, and you open these up and you, you give the ability to the citizens to handle this material themselves. And it, and it prevents a couple of things. A number one, it, it's, you know, it, hopefully will decrease the amount of, of impact on your crews, your local crews, but also it gives, let these people get it, get it off the right away themselves and get it to, to a safe area where here, where it can be handled. You can separate it like this little diagram has here. You can, uh, this is a perfect scenario. You've got it separated. You've got a vegetative pile, a C and D pile of white goods and an HHW, and you can kind of see the one way traffic. You come in, you stop, you unload whatever you've got in your little trailer there, and then you, you go ahead and exit the site. This is a great way for, for local governments to, to kind of put some of that responsibility back on the citizens themselves and say, look, we can't come pick up all this debris. We don't have the manpower. We don't have the equipment. But here's what we can do is we've opened up four residential sites and, and it's free to citizens and you just come, come handle this material. Now, all of a sudden, you have maybe one, two, three sites that you have to worry about you know, handling this material and getting it to its final location, as opposed to dealing with, you know, the entire city or the entire county, which can be quite overwhelming. Um, you know, it does take a little bit of uh, it. Obviously, it takes you have to identify the space, the area where you're going to put it. And it does take a little bit of staff to manage it. You know, you don't want people, uh, you know, coming in the exit and, and leaving through the entrance and, and going backwards and doing U-turns and stuff. So it takes some some traffic flow and some other considerations. But when you're comparing it to the, the what a, a potential full scale debris removal operation would be, it's, it's pretty easy. And it puts some of that responsibility back on the citizens. Uh, we've seen it used uh, to great success numerous time almost every storm even if we do get declared and there's a full-blown uh, monitor hauler debris removal operations we still usually open up some residential drop-off sites and allow the citizens to handle it themselves if they choose to Matt what kind of documentation do you ask for at the I mean are you letting every Tom Dick and Harry or Tom and Jerry um, drop off at these sites no, that's a good point. So two things. One is obviously we're differentiating. We're not allowing commercial vehicles to come in there. So the, the tree contractors or whatever are not able to use this. They need to dispose of that material on their own. And also we do need to make sure that the citizens that are utilizing this site are actual citizens of, of the area. So whether it be a, a city or a county or whatever, you know, we don't want... Um, uh, the, the people from the neighboring cities, maybe they haven't opened up residential drop off sites and now the word has got out. So they're all driving over 15 minutes to the next neighboring city to, to dispose over there. So we do usually man a tent or, or the, the local government there will identify some staff to man a tent. It's something very simple, but we just log who came in um, and, and maybe just check a, a driver's license or something like that, just to ensure there is some some checks and balances there to, to make sure that you're uh, you're not allowing uh, people that shouldn't be to use utilize the site. Hey, what do you think about Matt uh, co-locating this site with like an existing uh, drop-off site? I mean, you know, I know, I mean, these things get pretty. I'm just, I'm looking at these arrows and I'm saying, you know, I've seen some pretty sizable lines of cars, <laughs> uh, you know, back up on these things. Any yeah, thoughts there? Sure. Yeah, no. And that's that's something you got to take into consideration when you're talking about residential drop off sites and also DMS sites when you're talking about maybe possible sites for contractors to utilize one of the biggest impacts and I think we'll cover it in a couple more slides when we start talking about safety. But one of the biggest impacts across the board when you're talking about debris removal, whether it be doing it in house force account labor or bringing in contractors with with double barrel uh, haul trucks, self loaders, whatever the case may be is the impacts to traffic. And you always have to take into consideration when you're talking about scouting locations and possible locations for these sites is what are the impacts to the traffic? Can the traffic safely get into and out of these sites? Uh, what if we do? What if this is a crazy busy residential drop off site and traffic does back up into the street? What is the impact of that? Is it going to back up into an intersection or is it going to back up and, and maybe into an arterial type roadway? Those are some some very real impacts that are very real possibilities that need to be need to be brought up. And, and maybe, you know, that first your first instinct of, hey, that would be a great residential drop off site uh, after further examination. Maybe that's not such a good idea. So somewhere where you can get off of the main roads um, and, and sometimes we've even done it adjacent to other DMS sites that the contractor is utilizing. But you have to look at traffic. You have to look at the interaction of those vehicles and what impacts that, that's going to have for sure. Thanks so much, Matt. 
Um, now, moving on to linking with volunteer agencies. I mean, volunteer agencies are really the backbone of the debris removal operation, the unsung heroes, if you will. And you have places like the Lions Club and Baptist Men's, but now there's organizations like Samaritan's Purse. You have the Team Rubicons of the world world you have all these different organizations that are out there cajun navy i mean all these all these lo loosely organized i mean there's there's apps again where people are, are talking cross pollinating there's there's websites like crisis cleanup um which is a great website we've seen that used successfully in a number of different disasters it's a national program which links people in need with volunteer agencies that are there who want to help help we've seen volunteer agencies come i remember one in um one time in galveston county where a community and a group came all the way from east lansing michigan for a whole week just to help residents clean up their property i can't tell you how great they are at getting either debris removed or debris removed to the right of way again we want to make sure that they're we recommend that they check in with the local office of emergency management help direct the areas in need not how they're going to do that you don't need to be taking on any more liability uh than you absolutely have to on this and uh um, letting them know what areas are completed and, and who needs the help most um uh, but i mean we've seen these uh volunteer groups come in with chainsaws with backhoes i mean uh, Matt, you've got some, you've had some pretty good experiences with volunteer organizations. I mean, anything to watch out for when dealing with them? Uh, well, I think your first point there is probably the most important. There, there needs to be a little, uh, uh, at least some level of, of organization or, or at, at least a check in with somebody, somebody there in the, whether it be the EOC or wherever the case may be, whatever makes sense. But but to, to know which which organizations are in town. Uh, where they're going to be working, some sort of, you know, I, you have local churches that on the weekends, one of their, their youth groups want to come help or whatever. And it's beneficial to be able to kind of point those and say, hey, we've already got uh, Samaritan's Purse is over here working in downtown. So why don't you go over here to the northeast quadrant and this neighborhood up here? You know, there can be a little bit of coordination there. Um, but you also want to make sure you've got the public safety aspect of that as well. You know, you've got people uh, in the neighborhoods knocking on doors, uh, maybe strange cars parked in the neighborhood, uh, you know, not done properly uh, with the proper credentials and, and the safety gear and so on and so forth. You know, you could you could have a public safety type issue there as well, where residents are a little bit hazard. Hey, who are these people in my neighborhood? What are they doing? Um, who are they? Are they legitimate? You know, do they have credentials? Can they identify themselves? So those are some things we've run across in the past. But it is important to make sure that those groups check in um, and, and, and kind of let let everybody know, be clear and concise and, and transparent uh, of what they're doing, uh, where they're going to be doing it and how long they're going to be in the area. But like John said, I, I tell all, everybody I can I, I, that I've got their ear. Uh, this is the huge part of the process that I think gets overlooked uh, or, or minimized way too often. Uh, these groups are are awesome and they do they can have such an impact uh in such a quick amount of time and, and help us with the debris removal process and, and help you with uh, getting the residents some assistance whether they be um, handicapped or elderly or whatever and can't do it themselves there's just a tremendous resource that I, I don't think gets enough like john said unsung heroes i don't think they get the credit enough and Matt, excellent points. And you, you hit the nail on the head about safety. And for that, I want to turn it over to Brian Rutherford and Matt to talk through the safety considerations in debris management. Yeah, so there's a lot of uh, safety considerations to uh, be thinking of when you're out in the field. And there's a, you know, it just can be inherently dangerous because you're out in this uh, area with a lot of debris you've got a lot of equipment so you have to be careful about uh like falling trees limbs and objects uh you know matt was talking about the the leaners and hangers and those kind of things can be certainly be a hazard to the the staff that are out there working uh, also uh equipment you, know, you want to make sure that people who are using the equipment are familiar with the equipment and uh you know wearing protective uh, personal protective equipment when they're using uh, using those things chainsaws and other things so that they uh, uh they can prevent injuries uh from chainsaws and you know generators and other things that they may be using out there 
And then, of course, being aware of uh, uh, potential hazards from you know, slips and trips and falls is always a potential uh, when you're working with debris. Of course, uh, as we've seen uh, recently with all the, the weather we've had, uh, you, know, you could have you know, severe weather can, can spin up fairly quickly. And so just keeping an eye on the weather, you know, what's going on and lightning. Uh, low light conditions is another consideration. We're going to be talking about all these in just a second. And then traffic accidents, electrocution, you know, potential from down power lines, stinging insects, poisonous and hazardous plants. So we'll talk more about those. But, you know, those are just some of the safety hazards to be considered. So in the next slide, we we we're talking about uh, some of the uh, falling uh, trees and limbs. So, you know, so we're, particularly when you're out looking for uh, leaners and hangers, that kind of thing, uh, you know, some of those, those uh, trees and the limbs, they can fall at any time. So really have to be cautious and, and tell staff to, to watch where they're going and keep looking up at the trees to make sure that, uh, you know, they know where the hazards are because those things can can fall or or break off at any time. And so if they see a, a area where there's a lot of uh, uh, trees that are damaged, you know, make sure they kind of take the long path uh, away around and make sure they approach it from the side that has the fewest hazards that could affect them. And then, um, you know, avoiding uh, damaged limbs and trees in the direction of the lean. So uh, try to stay on the safe side of uh, a dangerous tree. Or a limb. And next one. So traffic accidents. So there's going to be a lot of big trucks uh, going around, um, moving debris, picking up debris. Uh, you may have some loaders that might be working in conjunction with those trucks to, to load them. And so it's important to make sure that the contractors have flagmen to move, keep traffic moving around those or and to keep traffic from uh, going into those areas and make sure that the trucks are, um, you know, have someone kind of flagging down, make sure that you don't have any incidents there. And workers should be constantly aware of their surroundings when they're working to make sure that, uh, you know, they're looking for those vehicles that may be in the area. Also obeying the, the local traffic laws, uh, you know, if you, if you are working in that area to make sure that uh, you're being safe and being respectful of other people in the area. Hey Matt, when it comes to traffic, how about tarps on these trucks and and flying debris? I know, unfortunately, it's we've seen a couple of situations where somebody's had a tree limb in their, uh, um, you know, land in their their passenger seat. Yeah, absolutely. It's something that needs to be talked about very early on after a disaster, and and I, we've seen it handled a lot of different ways. Um, normally, a lot of areas have some sort of a, a tarp or some sort of covering. Uh, law or, or ordinance or whatever the case may be that 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 um, you know makes that mandatory as far as uh, covering your load whatever that may be. Um, a lot of times after after disasters they'll actually waive that requirement uh, if nothing else for a temporary basis. Um, you could you could see where that could become a problem with the haulers uh, you know slowing them down making them a little bit less efficient when you start talking about uh, tarping every load so what that that obviously comes with some hazards uh, that go along with that you, you're going to have limbs that that come out of the uh, that come out of the truck and end up in the middle of the, the, the highway or the freeway or whatever the case may be you've also got the the hazard of debris sticking out of the truck so either from the side or from up above you may have that one rogue limb that's sticking up and uh, I'll tell you just numerous times I've been behind a, a haul truck driving down the road and as he's going, he's got that limb sticking out the top and he's clipping every phone and cable line, um, <laughs> you know, for a three mile length of roadway. He's clipping every one of them and taking them down, you know, as he goes. I mean, it, it's definitely the, the hazard is there and you have to identify what, what does this mean and, and what can we do to mitigate this and, and try to. But at the same time, you want to make it efficient for the haulers as well, you know, so you get but you've always got to take into consideration the safety aspect of it. And, and if you do waive that that tarping or covering um, requirement, what does that mean and, and what, what, can, what can we do to address it? Um, I'll jump in here too, just real quick about traffic accidents. I, I'll tell you, I've had more. Uh, not to scare anybody or, or tell horror stories, but I have had more, uh, almost every problem I've had on a debris uh, job has somehow involved traffic, uh, whether it be uh, I've had monitors uh, hit by cars, um, 
I've had cars run into bucket trucks that were stopped that were the guy was up in a bucket cutting a, you know, somebody looks down at their phone, wasn't paying attention and rear ends the bucket truck. Um, I had one uh, elderly lady that there was some flagman there and he was telling her to stop and she didn't stop. She decided to not, I guess she thought it was a suggestion, I guess, and went around the flagman and actually hit a, a monitor and one of the, the helpers there uh, with the bucket truck. Um, I mean, there's, it's, it all comes back to traffic. It, it all comes back to, to the maintenance of traffic as far as cones and flagmen. Um, but you're, you're, uh, everything we do is obviously in the right of way. It, it's in, the, it's in the traffic. It's you're, you're in the, the right of way. You're, you're getting into and out of your vehicle. You're passing vehicles. Uh, you just got every, everything that, that could spell disaster. So that is by far the, the biggest stressor as far as I'm concerned when it comes to safety and dealing with debris management. Uh, it's something that's got to be looked at very closely. And this goes back to even the contracts. When you're developing scope of work and, and, and light items and you're negotiating contracts with, say, your hauler, you've got to make sure there's some language in there that, that addresses maintenance of traffic and what those requirements uh, are, are going to be or what those requirements look like. It's something that's got to be at the forefront of your mind when you're thinking about any kind of debris operation. Thanks, guys. Yeah, so another thing is lightning. Uh, you really need to train the folks who are going to be working out in the field that, you know, if they do have some bad weather stir up and there's lightning involved, they really need to take uh, cover under a sturdy structure and not run under a tree, uh, which can really conduct that um, the, uh, the lightning strike and, and injure someone who's taking cover under a tree. So, you know, best idea is that everyone should just you know, hold off, stop work, go get in a safe place and wait until, you know, all the, the, the lightning uh, uh, the, is gone uh, until it's safe to return to work. And then daylight hours, um, you know, for the operations that I've been involved with, they all start um, from sun up and they go to sundown. I mean, because there's a lot of uh, you know, pressure to get everything cleaned up as quickly as possible. And so you're really trying to use uh, all the daylight available to uh, get the work done. But it's really important not to, to start too early or work too late so that you have enough light to be able to see uh, what's going on. And so, um, you know, the general rule we say is field work must begin 15 minutes after sunrise and must stop 15 minutes before sunset. That way you have adequate number of uh, amount of light to see what you're doing and and hopefully prevent any incidents from occurring that way. Uh, next thing is on uh, power lines. Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, particularly, uh, you know, strong storms. You have uh, a lot of instances where you have down power lines. And so just uh, again, you know, keeping aware of surroundings, steering clear of power uh, down power lines, reporting that information uh, to uh, utilities so that they can take advantage, uh, take uh, actions to repair that and block it off so other people won't venture into that area as well. So uh, making sure people are aware of, of that hazard. And so um, also, but, you know, if you're going to be working with trees and uh, dangling limbs, hanging limbs, that kind of thing. Being aware that, you know, if there's power lines close by, that those could also fall and hit the power line. And so just being very aware of those surroundings and, and where you're working and what might hit those power lines and cause them to fall. So you know, don't stand under power lines and, and make sure you're, you're keeping safe and uh, aware of where those, uh, those hazards are. And then we have stinging insects and poisonous hazardous plants. Uh, I actually took that picture of the uh, of that little critter there, and um, you know that you know that's one of those things where uh, I was getting ready to step down and uh, and just saw that thing. So it's very important that uh, uh, you know if you uh, to to take precautions with insects, particularly since uh, majority of time we're working outside. So you know, using the insect repellent, following the instructions. Uh, wearing clothing to protect you, so wearing long sleeved uh, shirts and pants and enclosed footwear, you know, while out there working so you uh, so you don't run into any issues with uh, stinging insects or walking into 
uh, a patch of uh, of uh, you know a potential hazardous plant or uh, something like that that you might run into. So uh, don't avoid you know tell your folks not to wear any uh, you know, heavy perfumes or something like that that might attract uh, insects to them. And also making sure that staff that do have a history of, uh, you know, where they might be allergic to certain insect bites or, or other situations like that, that they carry, you know, they may need to carry an auto injector with epinephrine or something like that, you know, from their doctor. So just making sure uh, that, um, you know, they taken the proper precautions in the field to uh, prevent any allergic reactions if they've already had a history of that. And then just some other safety uh, recommendations, and that is to have a safety plan. So, um, you know, know where emergency facilities are. So if, if someone does get hurt, uh, you have a system in place, you know, to take them uh, to a, 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 a you know, medical facility, emergency room, you know, knows, know where those are. Uh, having daily safety meetings, just to remind people of what the hazards are and what they need to do. Uh, if there have been any incidents that have occurred, reviewing that with the staff to say, hey, this happened yesterday, you know, you need to watch out for those power lines or watch out for those you know, hanging limbs and just talk through those things that could happen and uh, to remind uh, staff that, uh, you know, they need to be careful and be aware of their surroundings. The other thing is to uh, enforce the use of uh, personal protective equipment. So if you're out there and people aren't wearing their hard hats, or the gloves or, or whatever you've indicated they need to be wearing, uh, safety goggles. Uh, make sure you enforce that. And sometimes you may have to make an example of a person, you know, just to say that, hey, you know, you need to be sure to, to wear this and make sure that people are aware that it will be enforced. And then make sure the people you use are trained in their responsibilities, are trained to use uh, the equipment that they're going to be using. Uh, make sure they're comfortable with it before you put them on there so they don't injure themselves or someone else. Make sure you encourage people to report any incidents or near misses. So that's an incident that almost occurred and may have, you know, almost an accident, but you just barely missed it. So make sure that you kind of learn from those incidents that have happened. You know, what can we learn from this? What can we do better next time so it doesn't happen again? And then be sure to take those corrective actions to reduce the risk of uh, future accidents and injuries. So if something uh, has happened or you've had that near miss, you know, look at what you need to do to um, revise those work practices or, you know, uh, some kind of uh, personal protective equipment that might be needed to protect uh, uh, staff that might be working out in the field. Hey, Matt, um, I, I, we wrap this and bring this discussion of safety to a closure. I know, I mean, it's it's big to us, big to our our programs. And I, I mean, I think we've probably seen a, a, a big increase in attention to safety. Is there anything, you know, like top three things that we're doing or that, you, you, you know, you, you want to implement in your program uh, that you could share with the team to help mitigate the risk of a lot of these things? Yeah, absolutely. I'll just kind of speak from a, just kind of personally with Tetra Tech and, and kind of the program that we implement. We take safety very serious. We have a, a de dedicated uh, health and safety director uh, that that is his duty and his job is to, to you know, help develop these plans. But we, we do what's called a HASP, H-A-S-P. It's a health and safety plan. And that that is for every single job that we're on. We develop a unique and um, and specific health and safety plan for each individual job. And it does a lot of the things that Brian was just talking about. So inside that health and safety plan, it's going to talk about all the different programs that we're going to be doing. Is it going to be right away? Is it going to be leaners and hangers, uh, DMS sites? Uh, anything else, any other hazards potentially, but it's going to go into each of those programs and it's going to talk about the requirements that we, that, you know, that it's going to go through the PPE that's required. You know, a safety vest is always required for all of our employees, but in some instances, we're going to require you to have a hard hat. We're going to require you to have safety glasses and we're going to require you to have steel toe work boots, for instance. Um, so it's going to go through each of those programs and what the requirements are of the individual. It's going to talk about what the requirements are from a Tetra Tech standpoint and what we're going to do. Um, I think the other important thing and it's it's I think I've seen it happen and it's just it's very important to do in my opinion is those daily safety meetings and that's literally every single morning before everybody goes in the field we kind of do a little quick brief and we hit on a couple specific topics so for instance if we're getting into the
the heat of summer and the temperatures are reaching, you know, 100 degrees or whatever the case may be. We talk about, you know, uh, overheating um, and heat exhaustion and staying hydrated. We may touch on those, uh, you know, particular things. When you're talking about uh, stinging insects and animals, that sort of thing, maybe it's uh, the snakes are, are more active this time of year and you're going to start coming across more snakes. We're going to talk about that in our morning safety briefing. It also gives us an opportunity, like Brian said, to talk about any maybe near misses or, or any incidents that have occurred and kind of debrief on those. What happened? How did it happen? What could we have done differently? Uh, any changes we may need to make on the fly to address some of those concerns. All of those things are important. It needs to be, you need to start from the very beginning before anybody steps foot in the field with a solid plan. And then that plan needs to be kind of a living and breathing document. It needs to be able to, 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 to mold and, and be modified and, and tweaked as necessary as you move through the, the different programs of the project. And, and as, you, as you move through these different programs, what are the hazards and, and so on and so forth. So I think it's very, very important. Uh, you know, to, to touch on all of those and, and to stay diligent with it. Uh, a lot of this, once again, kind of goes back to contracts too. A lot of the contracts, when you're talking about monitoring and hauler contracts, you're talking about a lot of times it's required to have a health and safety plan. Uh, sometimes a health and safety officer that's on site at all times, you know, um, some of that stuff, some of the clients, you know, uh, local municipalities, whatever the case may be, like to see those health and safety plans in some cases. So once again, just safety needs to be there at the forefront of any of the discussions and it needs to be maintained throughout. It's very important. Thank you so much, Matt and Brian. And so for our last section, and we're going to try to aim to um, wrap up in the next five minutes or so is just kind of go through really a lessons learned and trends in debris management, kind of what we're seeing, and then leave the last 10 minutes for any Q&A that the audience might have. So number one, I mean, we talked a lot of, I'm not, we got a lot of number ones, I get that. But one of the things to talk about and to think about is your, um, excuse me, one of the things to talk about and think about is diverting debris from landfills. Look at the type of debris, where it's going, and you know, in in northeast Texas, you've got a lot of options, a lot of paper mills, a lot of uh, other types of facilities that may want to take the wood, the logs, the wood chips. Just again, keeping it from just completely diverting and heading to the landfill is something you want to look at. Next is again looking at all the different types. Just don't be limited to one type of. Uh, a uh, measure of, of disposing of the debris, look at your options out there. And you know what, if somebody comes to you and says that they got the magic bullet and they can take all this debris, and if it sounds too be good to be true, it probably is. It's probably selling magic beans or selling your pipe dream and it's not gonna work out. I've seen some local governments get snookered. Uh, I think that is probably the most appropriate word in to, um, uh, you know, uh, whole you know this this whole idea of hey we'll take it for free or we're gonna turn it into uh uh little balls and send it to the moon type thing not gonna happen uh so just but keep that in mind look at pre-negotiated contracts these are really those standby contracts you could really look uh you know look to i know that there's a lot of different local governments a lot of different examples you type in the words debris removal rfp into google or you type in debris monitoring RFP, boom, you're going to get a list of about 20 different ones. This is no shame in plagiarizing uh, or, or, you know, if it's more appropriate to say gathering inspiration. Just to do that, there's a lot of things out there. It can save you time and it, you can get better rates and you can know who these contractors are. There's a field manual. There's a lot of good information out there. This is a well-worn path and there's a lot of scrutiny on this. Again, things to avoid, look to do open, full and open competition, um, conduct all the necessary steps for uh, minority and women-owned businesses, uh, exclude contractors that have helped you write it or give you, you paid to write it, maintain written standards, maintain the appropriate records. Look at how did you procure it? Why did you procure it? Yeah, listen. And if you got to change your contract, you know, you got to work with the appropriate folks to figure out how you need to change it or you may go out to bid again. Listen, there are, are some issues. There are some challenges with uh, procuring non-competitive contracts. We have seen it done in exigent and emergent period. But something, again, 
whenever it comes to contracting, that's when you got to get the smartest people in the room involved and have them take a look at that, whether it's your legal counsel, whether it's somebody from the state or FEMA, people are out there to help you. Keeping away from fixed price or cost plus, uh, using time and materials on a limited basis, like Matt mentioned, those first 48 hours are, um, are, are really important. And then look, make sure all the provisions under 2 CFR are included. Make sure you maintain oversight of the contract. You can't go out there willy-nilly or rampant. You got to have some proper oversight of the contract. You're telling them where to go, telling them what to do, those sorts of things, like you would building a house. Same type of concept. Make it, these are the required provisions. These are, again, well-worn paths. You can go on the FEMA website. You can pull these down. Uh, procurement disaster assistance team, they have a document where it's in Word form. You can download it, slap it on your document, and you can go from there. Very, very easy. Uh, you've heard a lot about debris management sites. Make sure you, hi you highlight those and you find the right ones for your community. Um, you know, again, stay away from the ones that Thurston and Lovey Howe uh, like to frequent. You want to make sure it's out there uh, easy getting in and out of, but something really to take a look at. And then have that documenting, have that documentation for your force account, whether you're using your ICS 214 activity log, tying it back to equipment time, equipment use, any supplies, all those things have got to come together. And, um, and and finally, have a community action plan. Um, having that having that community plan, having your ducks in a row, is very very important to getting the, the word out. Uh, we also talk about evaluating the resources of the region. Kind of going back to, you know, those recycling options. Knowing who's out there and knowing what's out there, and always keep that in mind, especially after disaster. And then uh, pulling that debris management plan. This is this is FEMA's um, template for debris management plan. Again, Google debris management plan. There's some templates. There's some resources out there. This is not rocket surgery when it comes to this. It's just getting the right people across the table and in the room so that everybody's talking. Whether that's code enforcement, GIS, whether that's administration, public works, solid waste, your general counsel, your environmental services. Getting everybody together and say, what are we going to do when this happens? So with that, I'm going to open it up to any questions. Um, that is all we had as far as our prepared remarks go. And um, would love to hear if you'd like us to go over anything else or any of you in the audience um, have any other questions for us. You can either raise your hand and we can call on you. You can unmute your line. You can... Do whatever you would like. Hey, John, it's Valerie. Hey, hey Valerie. How are you? So well, great. Good to hear from you. Thanks for joining us. Sure. Um, I just want to make a couple comments. I think y'all did a fabulous job in this presentation. And I thank y'all for heading this up. Um, I just want to mention a couple things that we have seen over the past, you know, 10 disasters that could cost jurisdictions funding for uh, improper things. So number one thing is procurement. FEMA will deem things ineligible if procurement is not followed. So it's extremely important that you do do the procurement properly. Secondly is the TCQ and Historical Commission authorizations on temporary debris management sites. Um, we've seen a lot of projects be uh, ineligible for okay. not meeting that environmental uh, regulation and policies. Um, another thing is if you are going to haul and use a temporary debris management site, it is very important that you do something with that debris before hauling it to a landfill. Uh, FEMA will not cover second haul 
And if you're only using the temporary debris site for staging and then moving it to the landfill, that is going to be considered a double haul. So you either got to chip the material, crush the material, burn the material, uh, whatever you're going to do with it to reduce it down. Then you can haul it to the landfill because the temporary debris site uh, is basically used to reduce the material and lessen that impact at the landfill. Um, also, when you're doing a debris management plan or if you need help with contracting, we at TDM can also review your RFP and your contracts to make sure it meets the operational side um, for debris management. Um, I've been reviewing those for quite some time as well as the debris management plan to ensure that all the elements are within the plan that it, FEMA requires. So we can do that. Now on the procurement side, I prefer not to report on that um, because I'm more debris management, not procurement. However, we can have somebody from finance or even FEMA PDAT do a review of the plan on a procurement side. Um, other than that, great job today. And I thank you all for inviting me to listen in. Hey, Valerie, what would be the best, best way for folks to call you? Because you really are the queen of debris here within the state and really nationally. Um, if folks have a question, I know you've always been super helpful with communities all over the state. Well, there's several different ways. Um, what I prefer to do is have the jurisdictions reach out to their recovery coordinator or, okay. of course, unit chief Andrea, who is on the line right now. Um, they can go through them and then they can always forward it to me or copy me on emails. Um, but I want to have them as their direct contact being there within their region. And that way they know what's going on as well. Um, and but they always know how to reach me at any time for any question. Um, and Andrea is great at that, and I appreciate her up there in Region One. And then you've got Michelle Ellis, who is the unit chief down in Region Two for the uh, southeast side, uh, Houston East. So a um, lot of great recovery coordinators out there. I talk to them daily. So absolutely reach out to them or even their district coordinator uh, is able to reach me as well. Thanks so much. Uh, and Andrea, thank you for being with us. Any, would you like to say any words to the audience here or for any contact information or anything like that? I, I, I yeah, again, we can't, we just had so much success in, in uh, working with the TDEM over the years and it's been fantastic relationship. Sure. Good morning. Can you all hear me? Yes. All right. So thank you for uh, inviting us, John. I actually uh, recall that I, w I had a uh, working group that you joined yeah. in Austin uh, from one of the legislative sessions. We worked on a, a big project together. So thank you for giving me a call and, and inviting us to join this uh, webinar. Um, we do have contact information that I can send out through the TDEM district coordinators. We also have uh, Nathan uh, on the line as well as Dion uh, for DDCs 5 and 6. So I can send that contact information uh, through them and our local jurisdictions will receive that. Um, if there are any questions, again, um, as Valerie mentioned, please feel free to reach out to your regional staff your recovery coordinators reach out to me or district coordinators um, and we'll be happy to help you in any way that we can. Thank you, John. Oh, thank you. Any other questions or uh, anybody want to make a comment as we close today's webinar? Hey, John, this is Michelle Bates with TCEQ. I'd like to say a couple of words if I can. Of course. Thank you, Michelle. Yes, I would just like to say that this um, workshop has been um, very timely as we're going through um, a large amount of rain at this time and that um, a lot of the times that we see these disasters, it's not necessarily a major hurricane or a major tornado. Sometimes it's a flooding issue 
And so I, I do appreciate the timeliness of this. And I just wanted to say um, really the most important thing as far as we're concerned is to get ahead of these disasters. And so if the county wants to reach out to TCEQ um, to pre-identify sites that you would be willing to use um, for emergency management and for um, debris management, we would love to come out there, meet you before there's actually a disaster, before you need us, and um, identify those sites, get those sites pre-approved um, for you. And then once you have your disaster, all you need to do is call us, let us know, it's already a site that you've been to. You've pre-approved it. We'll do the. We'll get the paperwork out to you, and that's something that kind of um, makes the process go a little bit faster. And also, um, as I said, um, it's it's easier for us to get to know your emergency management folks before there's a disaster situation and before um, everybody's kind of in that frantic mode. Um, I think one of the things that you said earlier um, about contractor options was very another important thing to look at that you can do um, prior to a disaster. Be, if, look at um, some of those contractors, identify the ones that are closest to you that would be the most um, helpful to you and get ahead of getting those references, um, identifying uh, possible issues that they may have um, before you get into the disaster situation, you really need them right then. And that's really the only comments that I had. And um, please feel free to contact me or Tom Ernie, who's our emergency response coordinator um, for Region 5. We cover um, the Northeast Texas area, and we'd be glad to meet with you at any time and look at any sites that you would like for us to. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, for everybody, for joining today. We've reached our uh, two and a half hour mark, and, and we can't thank you enough for all your participation. Lisa, back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just I want to thank you, uh, Brian, John and Matthew from Tetra Tech. Awesome presentation, great information, great resources. Um, wanted to thank TDEM for being available on the call and sharing information and TCEQ for providing grant funds to the East Texas Council of Governments to be able to hold this webinar and also the folks from TCEQ that are on the call as well. So just wanted to thank you all and also thank all the participants for your time. We hope that you have come away with some great information, some new, maybe some reinforcement, some great ideas. And uh, I hope everybody has a wonderful day. Thank you so much.